Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. A warm welcome to day two of Hammer Festival, the 2020 edition, with the theme of mental health and social justice. My name is Karai Numuhire. I am a UGHE graduate in global health delivery sciences, but also I work in the philanthropy sector with the Seagull Family Foundation, and I'm also part of the creative industry as a writer. I'll be the host of today's conversation, and I would like to welcome you uh, to today's uh, conversations. So the Hamo Festival has a mission of creating a neighboring environment for strong collaboration between health sciences and creative industries. So yesterday, we kicked off our, our, our festival for the, uh, for the second time, which was the 2020 edition, and uh, during our opening ceremony, we heard inspir inspiring insights from uh, different speakers that were recognizing that art plays a critical role in healing and they also encouraged us to ensure that healthcare remains profoundly human. The Rwanda Minister of Youth, Mrs. Rosemary Mbawazi, did remind us that mental health has sometimes been left uh, to health practitioners yet art has enormous benefit into the field. She also reminded us that mental health issues in the past were kept private, never to be discussed even in a post-conflict country like Rwanda, not often pausing to reflect on the depth of the pain we felt as individuals and as a collective. During the same opening ceremony, Dr. Sheila Davis from the Partners in Health talked about the importance of building bridges across sectors in order to achieve health equity. Dr. Paul Farmer invited us to discuss the need of recognizing mental health as well as public health. During the same ceremony, Dr. Agnes Minaguaho, Professor Agnes Minaguaho welcomed us to the second edition of Harmon Festival. She promised us that despite the pandemic that we are experiencing as the world, this festival is gonna be felt as a live event. So despite the fact that we're not able to be together during this festival, we are going to be offering you an experience as if we are together uh, as a community. So we're gonna be ensuring that different innovations such as these digital exhibitions, gallery, photography are displayed online. That's part of the festival. We are also going to be live streaming different films from different artists from the globe. We have a global audience and you have artists and experts joining us from uh, uh, different countries. And they're going to be engaging with us through panel discussions, interviews, performances, and we are together even in, uh, the, in the midst of uh, the pandemic. She also reminded us to take a look at, at uh, the social de determinants of health, like race, gender, poverty that are affecting some communities more than others. We are turning towards art to find hope and enlighten our minds, she reminded us. Professor Miranda from the Wellcome Trust gave us some statistics about mental health issues affecting around 400 million individuals, and we do have limited solutions so far when it comes to mental health issues. She also took us through a research that is being done with uh, uh, active ingredients that can be used to reduce youth anxiety and depression. They are using lenses of healthcare, self-care, biological, behavioral, and societal factors to understand how depression and uh, anxiety is affecting the youth. And if you're interested in the, in the findings of this research, please do visit their website. She has shared with us the link. She has also told us that there are no solutions that fit all. We need to have a personalization and context in mind. And Njonge reminded us that diseases don't always only have biomedical explanations. They can have political, historical roots. They can emerge from social dynamics and can act, help us healing different issues uh, and the different uh, diseases that are affecting the globe. During the same conversation, we heard from Professor Renier who took us in a journey of understanding medical humanities. He reminded us that in order to tackle health challenges of our times, medical students and healthcare providers should be able to draw on intellectual and creative strength of a humanistic education. 
He also reminded us that when you combine arts and health, we have a sense of empathy, creativity, imagination, and that sense of empathy invites us in understanding each other, even when we come from different backgrounds. It is my honor now to introduce our guest of honor today, Honorable Lieutenant Coroner Dr. Munga Tarsis. He is the Minister of State in the Ministry of Health in charge of primary health care. Dr. Tarsis Munga has over 15 years of experience in leadership in the Rwandan health care sector. He has been heavily involved in research and advocating uh, for in, in research and advocating evidence based on uh, um, policies and different programs. So we're going to be hearing from his remarks. Thank you. Organized by University of Web Health Equity to create a conducive environment for strong collaboration between the health sector the creative industries in order to generate innovation, innovative solutions on health challenges using art and creativity. This event will, prop will propose a reflection on mental health and the social justice through the prism of art-based research. First of all, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the effort and the contribution of universal of global health equity in the development of the health system in Rwanda. I would also I'd like to thank the artists from all over the world for the organization of this important event and their commitment to improve the mental health and the well-being of the Rwandan population through arts and the creativity. The growing global challenge of mental health is a health issue that is rarely discussed, but loses lives and damages our family and the communities. This year, COVID-19 has changed lives around the world, changed the health sector, and interrupted essential mental health services just when they are most needed. It is understandable that many people are worried and stressed and anxious about the present and the future. It is expected that the need for mental health and psycho psychosocial support will substantially increase in the coming months and years, emphasizing our need to work together to tackle the mental as well as physical consequences of this pandemic. To address mental health issues, the Ministry of Health has decentralized mental health care services and integrated them into primary health care, where care is provided by mental health professionals and trained general practitioners in all health facilities. Rwanda is among the few countries in Africa that have fully integrated the mental health care in community-based insurance. That means that in the country, the financial burden of the mental illness is reduced as the poorest can now afford mental health care. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, research has documented and demonstrated that very concrete benefit of Act in, create, in creating and supporting mental health and the well-being. There is a healing process that is inherent in artic, artistic activities, which can fundamentally affect and change a person. It is precisely the quality that gives art both its intrinsic benefit and its power to make a positive impact on people's mental health and well-being. It is something that arts have known for many years, but it is something that policymakers and funders are only beginning to fully understand. So I am pleased that Harmony Festival has brought together some of the people who are leading the way in improving people's mental health and the well-being through participation in the arts. I hope that this festival can promote the debate and the pro provide great weight to the argument that the arts and the health services are indivisible. They should be treated as such, both by artists and the health professionals, and by those in charge of arts and health policy. In opening this festival, I want to thank you again for organizing it to discuss and collaborate on delivery, delivering health equity and the mental health being in Rwanda. I wish you all the best success for this festival 
and I'm looking forward to hearing the outcome of it. Uh, Honorable Minister, so we're going now to be looking at the today's agenda of day one of day two of uh, the festival. So we're going to be starting with a panel discussion, looking at how do we integrate arts. The second conversation is going to be around women mental health uh, panel, and uh, that will be the second discussion of today. And we're also going to be looking into COVID living. That conversation is also going to be diving us into digital exhibitions around stigma, power, and hope. And uh, to wrap up the day, we'll be having a conversation around resonant spaces, finding well-being through parks and music. But even if we had this festival online because of the COVID pa uh, pandemic, we also want your participation. We want to know what you think. We want to know what inspires you in these conversations. We want to know what are your thoughts? What are you struggling with? What have you overcome? Because in order to make it a very lived experience, we can't do it alone. So please, we have been through the pandemic lockdown and some of us have been using different arts, uh, forms of arts to heal, to treat ourselves and to remain sane. Among different uh, types of arts, please tweet about which ones you have been the most using. Was it visual arts? Was it music? Was it poetry? Was it literature or creative writing? Or was it performing, performing arts like dance or theater? We want to hear your thoughts. So please uh, reach out to us via different social media, either on our Instagram, at the UGHE uh, slash org, or Hamu Festival, um, the Instagram, but also the Twitter page. And we are using different hashtags, uh, which is uh, hashtag uh, Hamwe Fest 2020 or Hamwe Festival. So we can't wait to hear your questions, your reflections, but also feel free to challenge us. Why do you think that art heal? We want to hear your thoughts. And without any further ado, I'm going to be introducing the first session of today, which is integration of arts. So within mental health, art-based art interventions are designed as a way patients can create artwork as a way of expressing who they are when words can't work. And different art therapists have been using the artwork to understand their concerns. Researchers do tell us that singing, playing music, creative writing, and other forms of art have been quoted to reduce depression, depression symptoms, uh, to reduce the stress, but also to increase mental health uh, well-being. I would like to introduce uh, the moderator for do that panel discussion, Dr. Nadine Siegelt, who will be moderating our first panel of day two of uh, Hamwe Festival, which is entitled Integration of Art, Art-Based Research and Art-Based Interventions that will be discussing the contribution of art-based research in improving knowledge, but also understanding mental health and mental health issues. Dr. Nadine Sigelt is the Head of Culture and Development at the Goethe Institute, South Africa in Johannesburg, but also she's the Acting Director of Goethe Institute here in Rwanda. She works on a number of projects related to culture, creative industries, and civil society. With a background in curatorial studies, Sigelt is also a curator, a research, and a publisher with Iwalewa Books, and she's the former Deputy Director of Iwalewas at the University of Beirut. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. Her work started as we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors, and we we're also exploring the role of culture. Uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, these are everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. I was talking to my friends, I was talking to my friends, I was talking to my friends, and I was talking to my friends, and I was talking to my friends, and I was to if you have a job, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. My hope is the festival will um, foster understanding, collaboration, 
um, between the different uh, healthcare sectors, and the different artists. Hello, good afternoon, also from my side, and a warm welcome to our session titled Integration of the Arts, Arts-Based Research and Art-Based Intervention. I have the great pleasure to be here with a very international panel. I will introduce each and everybody one by one when um, it's their part of this panel. But just let me start with a small um, observation I have made yesterday when I was watching a Facebook post about a dancer. She was um, a prima ballerina at the New York Ballet and she was living with dementia for many years. I saw her sitting in her wheelchair and um, some music was brought to her and the music triggered a memory, the memory of herself dancing on stage. So even if she couldn't move much anymore, she was moving her hands, she was moving her body in a very beautiful way. And yeah, that was great, that was beautiful and it was triggered by music. And um, I was deeply touched by that. And I think this shows definitely what the power of art has also on mental health, even if you are not able anymore to move your full body as you have done before in your, in your past life as a ballerina, as a worker, as a writer. So art is still there with us, even if we have already entered into a new phase of our lives. So this um, was just an anecdote or an observation I've made yesterday. And when I watched it, I felt strongly that it fit perfectly into the objective and the aim and the motivation, not only of that festival, but also um, our panel. So I would like to first introduce the first speaker, Grace Cheng from Hong Kong. She's not only a curator of contemporary and community-based art, but she's also the director of Art and Hospital, which is an initiative that looks strongly at the relationship between art and mental health. So she brought us a small video today in which we see beautiful women dancing and speaking to each other and enjoying the, the great pleasure of arts. Um, and I would like to invite Grace now to present this video for us. And afterwards, we have a little time also to discuss it with her. So please, can you share your screen and join us here in the virtual space, dear Grace.
Uh, hi, everyone. If I may, Nadine, uh, I think I think Grace is in the attendees list. Okay. Uh, I just spotted her in the attendees list, so she may have joined the wrong link. You know, these things happen with our technology, so she's not amongst us panelists here, uh, and there's no way to contact her. So if you from the organizing team can connect with her, that might be great. Thank you, Arundhati. <laughs> Um, the digital world is still playing tricks with us, but of course we are prepared. So um, in, we will we will uh, show Grace video a bit later. So we uh, immediately continue with our second part, which is a panel discussion titled "The Benefits of Integrating the Arts in Mental Health Research and Interventions." And we have four great panelists, four international. Um, people who worked in that area for a long time and I will introduce each of them individually and give them the chance to introduce themselves with their works and with a project or projects. So our first speaker is Mary Lou Alaski from the USA. She is the director of the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth College. Here, she is leading the advancement of the Hopkins Center for the Arts and the Arts and Creativity at Dartmouth. She builds on interdisciplinary projects linking the arts with humanities and with STEM initiatives across campus and overseeing the evolution of the Hopkins Center into a 21st century state-of-the-art facility. She came into Dartmouth from New Haven, Connecticut, where she was the director of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. So Mary Lou, my first question to you is, and maybe with that question, you can also introduce yourself and your, and your work, your important work. For you, art and culture is a gateway to learning and also to empathy. Could you give us an example from your work that shows us how you put that beautiful idea into practice. How do you make that work? And how do you react if you would love to ask, if you would love to talk about that as well? Um, how do you react to the recent violence uh, and the recent violent events in the US with your work as well? Welcome, Mary Lou. Thank you so much, Nadine, and thank you to everyone at Hamwe. It's an honor to be with you all and among these esteemed panelists. Um, you know, the basis of the work that I've done both at Dartmouth and at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas, uh, which was a public-private partnership with Yale University, the state of Connecticut, and New Haven, uh, the city of New Haven has always been about um, the arts as being central to building bridges and creating a, a sense of healing possibility uh, by community building. So uh, it's an uh, it's exciting for me to see a university like uh, like this really delving into the details of what's possible when we all work together and arts are at the center. So um, the basis for the work that I do uh, on arts integration assumes that we all believe and, and have evidence that the arts are an informer, that the arts exist at the center of developing new knowledge, so very central to uh, research. The arts is a catalyst to that research and opens the door to uh, learning, but ultimately um, the strength is, is through the arts as a healer, as a community builder, as an empathy builder. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dartmouth and uh, uh, our community and one of the projects that we embrace to try to 
address uh, all of the potential that the arts have. And that's always our goal. When we embrace a program, we're looking to see how the arts can manifest change in all of the realms of its capacity. So Dartmouth was built on the unceded land of the Abenakis people, the indigenous people of the land. Um, when Dartmouth was built 250 years ago, it was promised to be a native, uh, a school for Native Americans. And in the first 200 years, it barely graduated 20 Native Americans and grew to an important Ivy League institution. As we're thinking about the arts as central, we're also in a very rural community. And uh, that land was not only sacred or is not only sacred to the Abenaki people, but, but it's also precious to all of us as we face so many environmental changes. And it's important that our environments are healthy in order for us to think about individual mental health. So one of the recent projects that we took on is to invite a uh, composer by the name of Carl, Carl, Carla Kilstead, not to create a performance, but to come and be in residence with us. Um, Carla's work uh, had been informed deeply by environmentalism. Um, she has been an artist in residence in the Woods Hole Ocean Institute for Oceanography uh, in Massachusetts. She came to Dartmouth and we asked her to look for what was inherently broken in our local society, in our, in our local um, displacement. And after uh, about 18 months of work, working with our environmental uh, studies scientists and students, working with our uh, sociology department and anthropology departments to understand where we are, working with arborists about the history of our trees, and ultimately engaging in listening and to very intentional listening with our Abenaki elders. Carla determined that um, she was inspired by an opportunity to write a musical requiem for the lost trees that Dartmouth's building had displaced and as such included and um, involved Abenaki elder, elders and poetry in that composition, but then pointed the work toward uh, the future by composing this work for a children's choir, actually the Brooklyn Youth Choir, who came and performed the piece uh, in staged, uh, staged environments in the newest of our uh, arts construction, actually, an atrium to our museum, and gave us an opportunity to send that message out into the world as part of the, the choral repertoire for youth choirs and uh, gave us a celebration to come together with displaced Abenaki's peoples and um, to remember that, in fact, we were uh, we as Dartmouth are on unceded lands and that we respect our community and uh, the Abenaki people and all indigenous peoples. Um, that's the, the kind of work that uh, I think creating in terms of creating artistic work gives us an opportunity to be multifaceted and to bring people together and give people voice. So as to your question about the current violence in the United States. Um, you know, Martin Luther King once said that violence is the language of the unheard. And I think that um, as we watch so many challenges uh, overlap, the COVID pandemic met with um, the racial inequity pandemic and the violence that comes along with it, especially here right now in the United States, causing political and financial mayhem. I go back to that statement often because violence and disruption comes when not everyone is invited to the table to tell their story. So in our practice at uh, Dartmouth, 
we are working, and at the Hopkins Center, we're working very hard to invite artists, of, particularly artists of color, Black, Indigenous, people of color from, from our communities and from around the world to uh, take space at the table and to formulate opportunities for storytelling beyond our, uh, our institutional environment in a very personal way that allows us to come together as a common humanity. So it is unfortunate that um, we are going through these times but it is very clear that the people who are both perpetrating the violence as well as the victims need more of a place to be heard. And so back to Martin Luther King's words. I think I'll leave it there, Nadine, um, unless you have another question for me. Thank you so much, Mary Lou, for not only addressing recent political events in, in your country, but also um, showing us how important it is to also consider the place where we live in terms of land and that we are part of the planet as well as human beings and that it matters very much. Not, not only we are healthy, but also the land that we live on. Thank you so much for that. We will come back to some of these questions and ideas later. And I would like to introduce now our second panelist, Jennifer Canary Nikolova, who is based in the Netherlands. So we travel to Europe now. She has um, very exciting projects um, she's working in. One of them is that she's the founder of Room for Thoughts, which is an artistic research practice that uses multimedia to address mental health issues. She was an artistic researcher in residence at the National Psychiatry Museum in Harlem and Wax Society Institute of, for Art, Science and Te Technology in Amsterdam. She was also the tutor of the honors program Art and Research of the University of Amsterdam and the Harold Rietveld Academy. Jennifer is most known for her PhD project titled Labyrinth Psychotica, and I recommend that you go to the internet and read about it there. Because today, Jennifer, I would like to um, invite you to show your five minutes introduction, and I've heard you brought some images or a small presentation for us. So welcome on the digital stage. Thank you very much. I will start right away by sharing my screen. Oh, the host disabled and attendee screen sharing, so I'm not able to share. It should work now. Now it should, sharing? yeah, now it does work. Okay, great. Yes. So, you can see it? Yes, okay, so Labyrinth Psychotica is indeed uh, my PhD project. Um, it was born um, after 2005 when my sister-in-law, who uh, carried the diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, she uh, passed away, um, uh, died by suicide in a state of psychosis. So that was quite shocking. And um, as an artist, it's, it's always very important, at least for me, to to process uh, high impact life events uh, through my work. Uh, so it, it began actually with me just trying to understand what happened to her and, um, and, and, and how it came to be that she would leave this earth. And I realized uh, quite quickly that after she died, I, I did like before her death, I did look it up schizophrenia, hallucinations and delusions, but I learned later, th th these are just words. It's like a big giant question box. It's, it doesn't tell me anything about her experiences. So I was quite shocked by uh, that revelation as well that, that I didn't know, even though I thought I know. So somehow I was able to trick my brain um, into knowing just by reading what the expert put, put, experts put online. Um, but that kick started a, a PhD uh, project in which I tried to investigate then what psychosis was. And I learned that Actually, we don't know what it is. We know what it can do, what it can cause. We know a little bit about experiences, but 
there's so many different stories about psychosis. Like in some cultures, it's the birth of a new shaman potentially. In other cultures, it's a gift uh, to connect with ancestors. And in the Western culture, it's uh, designated as an illness in a broken brain. And there's many, many different stories. There's like spiritual crisis, reawakening. So I was very confused by that, um, but also intrigued. So that, that, that started that journey um, in trying to understand. So then it became this PhD journey um, which uh, with a working title <laughs> is complex. It's creating and using immersive labyrinthine and wearable multimedia art, interactive installation art as a tool that could help better understand the subjective experiences of psychosis. But basically you can call it a do-it-yourself psychosis simulation. And uh, my research as uh, a path, how to simulate psychosis and why it's important. So um, I studied existing psychosis simulations. So if you want to learn about all the existing projects, you can find more about them on our YouTube channel or uh, in my PhD. So I can send uh, uh, the link at any time if you contact me. Um, and I wanted to show you a little bit about in one minute what my research journey was as an artist, where it began just for me and myself trying to understand the subjective experiences because I learned that there was a lot of research about psychosis but nothing really deep about what, what you actually experience and why is there fear and why do people act strange? So this is, this, this is one minute. I've never known what it means because I've never been close to him. So I've never known what psychosis like, means and what it is. I should have maybe found out, but because I don't have a good relationship with him. For this experiment, we will be linking your mind to the mind of a girl named Jamie. Jamie is currently located at a nearby hospital. By meandering into the labyrinth of her experiences, you will be making a valuable contribution to her recovery. Apollo? <sighs> what is happening? I have the power of Apollo. Difficult to know when it's reality and when it's not. So. so basically, you see the two simulations now in these images. One is a digital wearable, uh, twelve-minute experience that takes you in the into the mind of a girl named Jamie, and the other one is um, is a is a, is a large-scale labyrinth that simulates more the other aspects of uh, psychosis. So it really is a challenge then to understand psychosis and then find a way uh, to translate that for a person who has no experience of it and then use technology to do so. But in essence, we managed to simulate about 33 subjective experiences of psychosis. Uh, and in both you enter the mind of a girl named Jamie. And uh, we have after we launched it, we were quite surprised about the success. So what started first for me as a person, just to understand my sister-in-law, uh, got a, re a lot of requests to help other people understand the subjective experiences. So we have been training the police for quite a while, uh, their old uniforms and their new uniforms, uh, university students, um, mental health care institutes all over the world. We've been uh, to 20 countries right now and counting, and um, even Saudi Arabia, which, uh, provides some interesting cultural images uh, that I find the coolest image ever and uh, a, lot of, a lot of press. So that was interesting because then psychosis uh, enters the media in a different way, in a more accept acceptable way, a, a way of trying to discuss and understand the subjective experiences instead of the horror stories that sometimes can happen in psychosis, but most psychosis are actually quite innocent and harmless. Um, why is it important to do this? I learned also uh, recent research by Queensland University says that one in 13 people will experience a psychotic break before the age of 75. And that means a lot of people. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you'll get the label, but you will have a, uh, an experience. And yet it is hidden and we do not talk about it. And that's a problem. So I'm developing uh, a theory. That's what I'm working on right now. Uh, that departs from the concept of anoixis, and anoixis means open mind, and it is the name of the Dutch uh, client-patient organization, at least the organization with, with people of lived experiences of psychosis. 
And I'm using that to help people understand that psychosis uh, can really begin, for instance, with just colors changing. And what does that do to you? What does it mean if your colleague's, colleague's sweater uh, is bright? And uh, to end it, yeah, I'm working on five principles, uh, design principles to help understand psychosis, but also help other artists to simulate psychosis. And that's where I am. So thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Jennifer. This is also interesting. I'm particularly interested also in your work with the Netherlands police. Um, for the sake of time, I mm -hmm. wouldn't ask my second question now, but let's hope we have time later. But I would now um, hand over to my physical guest here at, the, at, at my side, who is with me here in the room, Willy Karakesi. He's a Rwandan artist. And uh, he lives and works here in Chigali. He became a professional artist at Uburanga Art Studio, where he developed his painting style. He has exhibited widely, not only here in Rwanda, but also in Austria, Germany, and the US, and many more to come, I'm sure. In, this in his role as an American refugee council change maker, he has created public art on topics such as peace and illustration and sexual gender-based violence at refugee camps in Rwanda and Uganda. And he was also invited for an artist resident residency at 32 degrees east in Kampala, organized together with the London School of Economics. And maybe most importantly at the moment, he is also the founder of Injiba Art Center. So Willie, a well very warm welcome to you as well. And maybe you could tell us a bit more about your practice. So you have a lot of experience working with displaced people and people living in refugee camps. So what is your approach to work with traumatized people? And what have you as an artist also learned from working with them? Thank you so much, Nadine. Uh, so I think I will focus mostly about the residency I've been doing because that took so long and there was a lot of parameters and a lot of continuum and Uganda wasn't easy. So uh, we were doing a project called the Political Titan, which was created by Tara Blackmore. And they had to engage artists as researchers. So the aim of this project uh, was uh, to fill the gap between the current knowledge of uh, the life cycle of uh, the, the war, the war happening in countries and the conflicts. And so as artists, we had to give a better understanding on, we had to give a better understanding on how the, the, the conflict affected the society we live in. So, so when we wish the, uh, at, the, at, at the place, and especially when you go for this project, you have your thoughts on how you want to do things. You think you have your, what you want to play, like many things we have seen. But this was another thing that we was going to face because there was a war happening for 20 years and people who have been forced displaced from South Sudan to Uganda and from Congo also to Uganda. So we had to engage with different angles in the East Africa. So. Uh, the, the first month was very uh, normal because we were still working on, on our own thoughts about what we think about people who have been first displaced. And then in the, in the middle of the project, we had to go to northern Uganda, where they call Kitgum and Julu, where we had to face the people who have been living in the in the refugee camps and also people who have been living in the DRC. And on the side of the camps, where we had to also meet the, the ex-combatant of the, the war. So I think that also challenged us because we had to find different approaches. And this wasn't very easy because the, some, the people who have been attacked was very traumatized and they had, uh, they had to share that with us and their will, and then also with uh, uh, the people who have been, who was the ex combatant they was telling us more about the reason why they was doing this and how it is to live with the society 
that they have been doing this uh, project. And then, yeah. So during the process, uh, as myself, uh, I couldn't just go get the information of those people, how they was, uh, they, they was fighting or maybe how what's happened to them and then just leave. So I had to find another approach and uh, it was an easy way. So I started to think like, I don't want to come and take the information from you just because I think we wasn't the first people to go there. There are many people going there with cameras, with uh, a lot of materials just to get the information about what we have been doing, what, what have been done during the, 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 the time. So that time I was, we didn't want to be the same because we wanted to, to see how we're going to contribute to this mental health and then not to be like we're attacking them to get this information from them only and we leave. So we just wanted to, to, to be 50-50 on giving information and also giving back the art because we was there as the artist and we had to share what we are doing as artists. So, so for me, uh, uh, I started to do body paintings while they were telling me stories. So I, I called it the, to cover the wound with the art. So because most of the people was telling me the, the life they have been living on and also they couldn't, they couldn't just easily tell you the story. So, but when you start to cover their bodies, which I was calling the wound because they, they, they are their own, they start their own their stories. So I was covering them, the body with the art. And then while they start to feel free, there was a connection between touching the story. And then they also feel free to really, to give me their stories. And then for me, that's the approach I did. So I was with other artists, uh, one from Kinshasa and another one from Uganda. And they also have different ways. But then the other thing which was hard be, was uh, to talk to the people who, I mean, the stigma which stayed because there was kids born during that war and they had to live with the society. So there was this mental problem and also the, the acceptance because some of the people was called Gangi Kome, which means uh, a jerry count without handle. So is, that's how they was calling the, those kids who was born in during that war. So they was calling them the Jerkan without handle. So which means a Jerkan which you can't move. So it's there full of water, but you can't move it. And, and also we had to do the public's art because uh, as a, uh, Artists, I believe, art uh, is uh, mentally, physically, and financially. So we ha we we thought that art can change what they think and also what they believe, and also to give the freedom of speech in the way they couldn't tell, because sometimes the art can say more that what the word more than what the word can say is, yeah. Thank you so much, Willie. I think um, it's very interesting for here of, for us to hear from an artist and his practice how you work with these processes, um, similar but also very different from what uh, Jennifer has talked us about. Uh, for the sake of time, again, I hand over now to our fourth um, speaker. Last but not least, Stephen Legary from Canada. He is the head of educational programs, art therapy study at Montreal Museum of Fine Arts in Canada. He's also a registered art therapist and couple and family therapist. He holds a master degree in art therapy from Concordia University McGill, where he won the award for clinical excellence. So Stephen, um, you are, this is what the internet says, you are currently the world's only art therapist working full-time in a museum. Having worked in a museum for many years myself, I know what a kind of difficult space that can also be <laughs> when you want to introduce new ideas, new methods and new tools. So it's exciting to hear that you have art and therapy to study within a museum context. Maybe you can tell us a bit more how that works and how you bring in these 
new concepts into a very institutional space like a museum. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much, Nadine. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm also happy to say that that statistic has changed. Um, I'm no longer the only art therapist that has the great pleasure of working uh, in a fine art museum. Um, but uh, I do owe a debt of gratitude for my institution uh, for being so um, ambitious uh, to create that position uh, that, I could, uh, that I could fulfill. So I hope that what our program at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts helps to do is answer the question, what is the role of our cultural institutions in being venues for the arts and health? Uh, museums, uh, theaters, concert halls, these are traditionally places where we go to take in the arts, to enjoy them, uh, for entertainment, for pleasure, uh, to be with others. Uh, but increasingly, um, we've, uh, we've taken on a role of being destinations for well-being. And it helps us also look at the history of art differently. Uh, that the history of art is not only about being educated, but it is also about having our experiences reflected back to us. So the creative arts therapies in clinical settings uh, use, uh, use uh, visual arts, they use theater, they use dance, they use music, of course, as a way of helping what uh, all of the panelists have described, which is helping people to externalize, to put out uh, outside of themselves what they are living with, uh, particularly uh, when they're living with difficulties with mental health and trauma. And what the, uh, the fine arts help us do is use those, uh, use those works in the galleries as uh, an opportunity to tell our stories. So art, art objects, artifact, um, are these ways for us to find connections while using the art as the, the, the intersection of where we connect. And uh, in our art therapy program, we've been able to work in collaboration not only with uh, a great number of community organizations, that is, listening to them about what they want to do at the museum, uh, for working with people with mental health problems, who have recovered from cancer, uh, who are living with trauma, um, who are on the autism spectrum, um, and uh, more recently running uh, groups for people that are bereaved uh, with loss. Um, we use the museum and its resources as a venue uh, where that healing can take place. Um, I guess I would also like to add to it is we are inspired by what also happens in community. And I know that this is one of the questions for a bit later, but um, we have a, 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 a space that is specifically for community gathering together. So not only to use the clinical model of how the arts can be applied in health, but to use community models as well, as they are equally important and the two are allied together. The way that it looks practically is we work with groups. Um, that's how people typically come through education programs in a museum and we build upon that. We have a bit, little more than 20 years experience working with different community groups and about a little over 600 examples of how those uh, take place. And so someone facilitates, like myself, with the group, inviting each person not only to connect through the visual arts on the walls, but then to create from themselves, uh, from their experience and creating those connections through the group. So I'll leave, I'll leave that answer there. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you also to bring our attention to the next question. I would actually love to ask all of you, the whole panel. Um, so the question of community and what role does community and collectivity play, not only in your work, but also in general for our connection between health, mental health and the arts. I would like to ask the question to Willie, um, because you're also founder of a space, the Indiba Arts Center, and maybe you can tell us a bit about why you founded that space and how do you, what kind of community do you want to see there? So mainly we, Indiba Arts Space didn't, is just to contribute to the Rwandan Arts Center and mainly to educate and also to exchange knowledge with uh, different artists because we believe uh, we believe that art have to to heal us in different ways uh, mentally physically and uh, emotionally so we believe that if we get more 
more knowledge from people who have different experiences, we can host them. And then also we invite the local people in our neighborhood and our everyday lives, which give us the inspiration. Uh, they can have workshops and then learn more from them. Yeah. Thank you, Willie. Thank, Thank you. I would also like to invite Mary Lou and Jennifer to respond to that question if you would like to. And I bring in a last and um, second question to the whole um, panel, if you would like to um, respond to that as well. It's more political, actually, and I would like to ask all of you, what do you think um, should societies and maybe also governments do? How can we implement um, the work on mental health and the arts better? And what would you put on the agenda of your government as high priority? If you would like to respond to that question, um, I address Mary Lou as the first one here. Thank you, Nadine. Um, first, to address the, uh, the concept of community, um, two communities that I participate in um, that are, in fact, uh, large networks for change that I think are helpful to know about. One is the International Society for Performing Arts, which is um, uh, essentially uh, 500 plus members around the globe of arts leaders, performing arts leaders primarily. But um, one of the most important programs, I'm, I'm the most immediate past chair of that organization. And one of the most important programs that I think uh, that organization has been able to launch is a global leadership program for emerging leaders who are engaged in arts immersion and arts integration um, and are looking for uh, collaborative relationships around the globe to advance the ideas behind the fact that we what we believe that arts can heal that arts can be center central to uh, learning and research and change so um, that's a resource for everyone. Um, I'm also on the executive committee of uh, an organization called A2RU, which is an arts alliance of 40 uh, American research institutions. And I think here we have a very important initiative where uh, this organization has brought like-minded research institutes together to uh, build best practices and research that supports the importance of the reintegration of the arts and sciences in responding to our human needs and actually our most urgent human needs. Um, recently, that organization commissioned a study from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Math in Washington. It's called Branches from the Same Tree, and essentially it quotes Albert Einstein, who uh, reminded us that although at some point in time in the 18th century, philosophically, we started to separate the arts and sciences, that in fact, a complete human being needs a holistic approach to the integration of these things in order to make both personal well-being and societal well-being possible. So um, those are the things that that's the intersection where I think community can come together through powerful networks and actually influence change and um, and support the kind of research that uh, establishes substantially uh, why our respective approaches, all the things that we've talked about, have meaning and uh, are part of how we heal for the future. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. Jennifer, would you like to respond to either the question of community or what you would like to put on the agenda of politicians or maybe to both of them? Okay. Uh, so uh, with regards to community, uh, my project, uh, I worked directly with about 60 partners, so I could not have done that alone. And uh, so community for me is very, very important. And with regards to the second question, um, what governments can do is focus on uh, the projects that have success and proven success and listen to them. Think about projects like open dialogue. 
um, in which the subjective experiences and the stories matter and are at the forefront and the healing aspect of that just to be heard and how important that is, um, I would um, ask uh, governments to really pay attention to subjectivity and storytelling in this. Thank you. Thank you also for being brief and very precise. Um, I would hand over to Stephen again and ask him about what you would put on the agenda, um, considering that museums are also a very highly politicized space, mm -hmm. um, especially in our days when we talk about restitution and repatriation. So maybe that also something that matters in your work. It certainly does. I would say on a, on a general level, governments have an important role to play in the destigmatization of mental health. Um, our own government, regional government in Quebec, has recently announced a great deal, degree of funding for mental health, but it took a pandemic for us to get here. That is to recognize that what already existed pre-pandemic was vulnerability, and now we have the expression of that vulnerability on a massive scale. Um, so responding to the clinical aspect of how to support people through mental health is important, but equally as important is the community dimension. So highlighting, supporting, funding, and pointing to the community resources, as uh, Dr. Canary said, that exist and have been proven models. Um, an, individual, uh, an individual's personal resilience is manifest through how they're supported in their community. So capitalizing on what an individual is able to do and how they're able to move forward in their healing journey is entirely dependent on who's surrounding them and how they feel supported. Um, and everyone has that resilience. So uh, I suppose to answer the second part of it in terms of museums, which are highly politicized environments, um, I would say that the piece, particularly in North America, what we call the decolonization or the re-indigenization of museums um, is a long and hard work ahead of us, um, but one that is essential if our museums are truly to call themselves um, uh, environments for health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing in also the aspect of decolonizing. Um, Gugu Iwathiongo wrote a book um, that was called Decolonizing the Mind many years ago, and I think um, it's also about um, creating mental health um, through a process of deep decolonization. I think that matters for all of us. I would like to ask really if you would like to say something about these questions before we close this panel and um, maybe some questions would come in, but there's also the video still and I've heard it's also there. But before we do that, um, really, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I think Jennifer said it all because we, we can't do what we have done because uh, the government always have, is supporting us and I think she said it, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Willie. Before, um, yeah, let's, let's see if Grace Cheng is there now and uh, we just swapped the order. Um, I've heard she is now with us in the digital space and her video work as well. So welcome to Grace Cheng from Hong Kong. Are you there? Yes, thank you, Nadim, and sorry for the first. Um, I was in another link, so <laughs> I was a participant right now, but I'm back. Okay, because uh, I have two videos, so uh, to make uh, to make it fast, I will show both together. Okay, so thank you. I do now.
Grace, can the organization help you? Grace, if uh, you have difficulties to share your screen, we can also mm -hmm. um, stream mm -hmm. the videos from here. Oh, okay. So can I do it again? Yes. Is it okay? So should we stream them? Yes, it works. Okay. Sorry, is that your screen now or is it ours? That's hers. Can you probably stop sharing your screen and okay. stream the videos from Okay, here? maybe you Sorry you, for the You confusion. do that, yes. Okay, okay. Okay. So just come back to us and mm -hmm. then we try to stream it from here. Okay, sure. 我們是大概一二年開始的畫班大家<笑> 出來了來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來來
can we share the other one? We have another videos. Yeah. I've been here for a few years, and I feel like I'm happy. I'm happy. Today我們來到特別要在花園裏第一次出來其實我不懂說話我覺得很舒服這個公園很多顏色的植物都很少見很喜歡這個情景因為第一次來這個環境裏面令到人的心情很舒服我將我是自己心裏面想出來的一筆一落都是我自己一手畫出來畫畫呢即是好像提升了自己的那個視力好像提升了很多很多東西最好多一些活動給我們玩因為我們幾天上其實都除了去飲茶行公園啊好少有這些還可以學畫畫還可以學習好多朋友啦睡著之後看看到我的幸運呢我藝術家就是照顧我了我滿意是老師讀得比較好教識我們的話阿 好好學,同埋互相支持,互相鼓勵,一起用心畫一張畫。每次畫完張畫出來之後,其實我是第一個會覺得很震撼的,因為我都沒有想過大家原來這麼有創意,這麼有想法,同每一個畫出來都這麼
and became the executive director in 2013. She has 20 years of experience in arts philanthropy after spending seven years in the corporate sector. And she's also the recipient of the Global Fundraiser Award from Resource Alliance International. And our second speaker is, sorry, Pallavi Chander, um, a CISM trained drama and movement therapist and arts based therapist in Bangalore, India. She works not only with children, but also adults with learning disabilities, caregivers and young people challenged with mental health concerns. Um, you are not only going to introduce your work at the India Arts Foundation, but you brought us a research project, which was a mapping exercise. Um, I'm very curious to hear more about the city-based study maps um, that you developed, that um, scopes and dimensions and contours of the work that has happened at the intersections of art and mental health in Bangalore. So this brings together not only a space, an urban space, but also initiatives, collectives, and what you have found in the city. A, well, a warm welcome to Arundhati and Pallavi to our panel here today. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, it's delightful to be among uh, such eminent practitioners and um, thinkers around the area of mental health and the arts. So what we'll do is I'll speak for about five minutes just to introduce where this research has come from. And Pallavi, who's been the key investigator in this project, will share some of the research findings um, of, of the program that we undertook. So as uh, Nadine said, I work with India Foundation for the Arts. We are a funding organization. And having funded arts and culture projects um, over the last 25 years, we are at a very privileged vantage point to see exactly what is happening in the broad arts and culture space across the country. Some of you know India is huge. It's the seven largest country in the world. It has 1.3 billion people. It has thousands of languages in different regions. It's actually not one country. It's so huge that it's almost multiple countries um, living in multiple kinds of time put together as one large geographical space on this map. So we must remember that when we are sharing our work with you, it is very specific to a very specific location. Now, our interest in the space of mental health and the arts came from our deeper interest in arts practice and wellness, wellness of human beings. Uh, experience of human beings. Broadly across all our other programs where we support arts research, arts practice, arts education, our focus has been to look at those kinds of artistic and scholarly journeys that challenge dominant narratives in the world, that investigate silences, um, that investigate stories that are not told, stories that get erased, voices that are often uh, hushed down with the larger noises around. And this is across the sort of boundaries of gender, sexuality, re religion, language. We try through the projects that we support break the, um, the confirmation of privileges established in our, in our societies. We attempt to do that through the support that we make available to uh, artists and scholars. We are also a totally non-government organization, which means we are independent. Our funding is independent of the government. We raise our own support from different sources and give them away as grants and project support to artists and scholars. Now our interest in wellness and arts practice came from two very different spaces. One of course is something that all the eminent speakers in this session already spoke about the space of enrichment, the space of healing, uh, the space where we are trying to deal with our human conditions of suffering and experiences. And how do participation and experiences of the arts help the process of 
coping better, getting better, dealing better, and uh, becoming richer. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect that we also take very seriously is how do our differences of experiencing the world, whether it is through lives led with certain kinds of abilities or disabilities, certain kinds of conditions, how does that impact the arts practice itself? So there have been so many examples of, uh, say, writers or poets or people in theater who have uh, been with, who have lived with mental health issues and conditions or physical disabilities. And how has that impacted or enriched actually the practice itself? So to give an example, if a person with uh, issues of sight, if a blind person was to do photography, what would that photographic practice look like? And what would it offer to all of us who probably do not have uh, that particular condition? So that's also a concern that has been um, a thought within the India Foundation for the Arts. But unfortunately, the arts and culture scene in India, the sector in India has absolutely no support or infrastructure for either looking at uh, wellness of mental wellness and arts, that intersection, nor the intersection of disability and the arts. And uh, we struggled a lot to even understand where are we, what are practitioners doing? From our own experiences of the field, we know that in spite of no support, in spite of no infrastructure, a lot of, in spite of no training, a lot of artists have themselves in their own way tried to deal with these areas and have through their own practice worked in the area of art and therapy, art and mental wellness, art and mental health issues. So it was um, kind of serendipitous when we met with the Wellcome Trust and they shared their interest in this area. And um, as staff at IFA, we were delighted that we found somebody who thought this was important. And as the very first thing we said is, while India Foundation for the Arts is a nationwide organization, we are based in Bangalore. So let's try and understand this landscape in the city of Bangalore. And again, we were very fortunate to have Pallavi Chandar, who is both an arts practitioner as well as an art therapist and who has worked with very different kinds of people within, within these two areas and the intersection of, of that. Uh, she had been an ex-grantee, an earlier grantee of IFA. And in our head, she was the perfect person to help us explore and understand what the map of Bangalore looked like. And that's why well, that's why Welcome Trust, IFA and Pallavi, we all came together and we said, let's understand how does the city of Bangalore look at the intersection of mental health and the arts? So with that, Pallavi, I will request you to share your journey with this research project. Thank you. Thank you, Arundhati, and um, welcome to everyone who's listening. This is, um, this is really something. Um, like Arundhati mentioned, I am Pallavi and I'm an artist and creative arts therapist from Bangalore. And yes, I work with individuals and communities in the capacity of a therapist and an art facilitator. And, um, you know, recently I heard this line and in a documentary that said, people are formed by the landscapes that they grow, grow up in. And for me, Bangalore has really been that landscape. I was born and raised here. I've lived here all my life. Um, so it is with immense pleasure and gratitude for me to share what I've learned from the artists and art organizations who I've met in the course of this research. Um, I'm just going to share a screen share in about a second. Yes. Okay. And yeah, to start, um, really the the research looked at mapping the intersection of arts in the mental health space. Um, and for this, I met 25 uh, key enablers who I would call the arts, artists, art therapists, mental health uh, professionals, and arts and cultural organizations. 
and um, the questions really that I asked uh, them uh, looked at learning from their experience and learning from the and understanding their journeys of their practice, the challenges, the limitations, and gathering recommendations and suggestions that will help them go forward um, and also support their work as they as they moved ahead with their work. Um, and I've put down the key insights from this uh, research in two sections. One is notions of space, which I've sort of broadly categorized as physical, mental, and sensorial. And the second aspect is accessibility and learning to be inclusive. And then I conclude on an aspect which I think a lot of the panelists have uh, touched upon, which is highlighting how personal transformation can accelerate collective healing. Um, and now to start with the notions of space, um, several respondents spoke about a need for a physical space, which some of them also called it a processing space, a space um, like Stephen also mentioned, a space where people can actually come and work uh, and gather and talk about mental health and talk about the issues that they were going through. Maybe not even talk, just interact with the art and see what what is really going on within them and process it in a way that doesn't uh, really force them to come out with any outcome per se, uh, but really look at what the process itself can lead to. And um, these these collaborations and these gatherings could also potentially lead to uh, collaborations and partnerships between artists, mental health uh, professionals, and the arts and cultural organizations um, to create safe spaces um, for groups of people whether it's a community or a neighborhood or, uh, you know, irrespective of their uh, backgrounds, can come together to interact, dialogue with artistic expression and share outcomes without the pressure of, um, of being performative. And this can help process uh, the impact of collective experiences. And, you know, the pen like the pandemic and the time we spent in the lockdown uh, phase has dramatically magnified the need for connection and um, existing spaces, arts and cultural spaces, like Arundhati mentioned, you know there is a lack of infrastructure, but there seems to be a need right now, a dire need to realign and change their status quo to accommodate the current needs of for healing spaces, uh, which could fundamentally transform how people use these spaces and also take care of these spaces. So it would be important to look at planning, designing, and conceptualizing the spaces in a way that would actually allow for people to use them for their need. Um, and if arts were to be used, uh, you know, then it, in these spaces for well-being, then it needs to be accessible, consistent, sustainable, uh, so people can really work through the things that they are going through, what's present for them, and whatever the life for them in a very calm and quiet way, and also in a more encouraging and less intrusive way. Um, and there are some efforts towards this that, uh, you know, some spaces, certain spaces in the city have already sort of started. There is a theater space um, called, there's a theater space called Ranga Shankara that has started talking about wanting to do this with their space uh, and the community that lives around the venue. And now I would like to draw your attention to the artwork on this slide. Um, the work is done by uh, an, a visual artist and illustrator called Sanaksha, and she is an artist from the city. Um, her work looks at uh, themes such as uh, ideas of care, body image, gender, and she addresses mental health and intersectional feminism. Now, a lot of her work are put out on social media. And, uh, and one of the reasons she does this is because she feels that uh, the social media can be a space to normalize conversations around mental health. And that get, takes me to the second point, which is to break the mentality around mental health. Um, there is a lot of stigma attached to mental health and, um, and talking about it when it comes to, uh, you know, considering what is normal and acceptable in the society. Having a mental health concern is still looked at as being weak, um, and showing vulnerability is not embraced in spaces that we interact on a daily basis. Um, although Bangalore as a city 
is considered to be quite open in having these conversations and we do have facilities and a lot of um, access to therapists but it is um, only with a certain section of the society it has not permeated into into different sections of the society like the disadvantaged communities um, and it there is also a need for these conversations to go into um, social institutions where we interact. And by this, I mean, first starting with having conversations with oneself to understand how we have internalized or understood mental health itself, where we have got that information from, how much, uh, how, 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 how much, how much prejudices we have actually carried, are, are carrying within ourselves, and and then extend that conversation to our families and our extended families because this would be important to sort of normalize those conversations and then how this can further expand to our educational institutes, our medical spaces. The reason for this is because when it comes to mental health and talking about it, there's always a conversation about brushing it away, saying it's not that important, you know, have to get, get on with things. Uh, but but there are certain un, uh, certain things that we have internalized. It could be milestones of success and failure, uh, parental expectations from their children, um, how what we are supposed to be ex, ex, expected to do in our workplaces, the pressures of living in a society that is patriarchal. Um, you know, there is a certain kind of gendered training which is internalized. But these conversations need to start. We need to start having these conversations, and to have those conversations, the arts can be a catalyst. Uh, it can be safe, and it can create non-judgmental non spaces um, where these shifts uh, can happen with our mindsets. And we are really looking at, you know, paradigm shift with understanding these aspects. Um, so that's really around breaking the mentality around mental health and a lot of respondents couldn't insist more on this um, and especially with medical uh, with educational institutes right now because considering most of the work has gone online there's a lot of pressure on students and um, and the educational institutes are not able to handle the pressure uh, as children students are not able which is leading to a lot of mental health issues, which again don't have spaces to be addressed. Um, why this is important? It is important to talk about it and normalize these conversations because it is important for all of us as a community, as a society, to expand our awareness, to become more, to be better informed, and to also sensitize ourselves so we understand and support someone who is going through this, potentially going through this. Um, as well as, the, and the fact that it is really relevant right now um, is because it is when, when a person is going through a mental health concern, it's not only about the individual, but also all the other aspects around the individual that's, that's pushing the individual to struggle with mental health, with a mental health crisis. So it's important to really look at it as a community. Mm, and then I'd like to move to the next aspect which is acknowledging, yeah. Hello, may I quickly interrupt you mm -hmm. just um, quickly. One um, question, could you speak a little bit louder? Hold a bit louder? Microphone. Yes, okay. and second question, just for the sake of time, mm -hmm. um, if you could start up, uh, wrapping yeah. up, um, because yeah. we have um, questions coming in and yeah. we would love okay. to give audience a bit of time. Thank sure. you. I will try my best to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to really quickly again talk about uh, when I'm talking about acknowledging sensorial overload. Um, it is to really look at how important nature is and interacting with nature, and that's something as a city we have lost our green cover. So um, again, the importance of how that impacts our understanding of mental health, as well as embracing. Um, the body, there were a lot of respondents who spoke about how important it is to learn through our body and tap into the knowledge and wisdom of our body. Um, again, this is a work called Positively Shameless, which, um, again, I've left it on the slide. And because we have lack of time, I'm going to quickly move to the next slide, which is looking at accessibility 
and to look at how uh, the arts can can be a container to address some very um, important issues that communities in disadvantaged communities and marginalized communities could be facing. Um, this is a, a program that has been running for three years in a community library in a um, marginalized community where children address uh, some very difficult issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm going to quickly move to the next slide, which is learning to be inclusive. And here, really, when I'm talking about being inclusive, um, you know, I would like to really insist on how important it is to include the disability community as we're talking about mental health, like Arundhati mentioned, and look and also understand what it means to live in a time where the political situation and the political climate does impact our mental health. So what does it mean to really create neutral spaces to address these issues? Um, and then certain recommendations that came out from uh, our respondents was uh, support trainings and academic level programs and arts therapies. Although we have had the presence of arts therapy in India for over two decades, it's only around the last 10, uh, 10 years that you know, it has really picked up steam. However, we still don't have academic level, an undergrad program or a master level program. And there's a need for that. Um, there's also a need for research and to support research and documentation of the work that is happening right now, but also to look at what it means to uh, borrow and learn from our own indigenous practices and how that can inform our practice going forward. There's a lot of work happening in the field uh, by, by different artists um, and, and, and pioneers in the field. What we need right now um, is to come and collectivize together so we can create more ethical practices uh, and ethical frameworks going forward. Mm, and again, I'm going to very quickly mention this, the fact that um, you know we do need support from the government. So there's, uh, dire need to have them on board and create those spaces for conversations with government bodies. Um, also look at funding, uh, both public, private, and, and also look at how uh, the efforts of the current practices can be further supported. Um, the last point was to look at rather a warning, a cautionary warning from some of the, uh, uh, from some of the respondents which was to look at not to make sure that arts don't become prescriptive because that there is a tendency to become like that. When arts become prescriptive, then it becomes box, and then that can really have a devastating effect on people who are working Thank you. towards it. Yeah. Again, I'm closing sorry it with to, this slide. Yeah, I understand. Again, this is, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you so much. That was really mm. amazing. Thank you so much also for bringing in new aspects here, like also the importance of the body and body positivity in relation to, to mental health. That was really deep. Thank, uh, thank you, Pallavi and, and Arundhati, for um, presenting your work to us. I am sure we have all seen a lot and learned a lot from it. Um, it's um, unfortunate that we don't have more time to dig deeper. Um, we still have some 10 minutes or so for questions. Please also, dear audience, send your questions to the India Art Initiative. And this is an amazing project that we can still take it in. Um, we won't have time to answer all of the questions, but I'm sure the festival organizers will be happy to bring you in contact with the speakers if you have uh, more questions. So please um, write to us and send um, your questions and also the people you would love to get in contact with. So um, I have to be a bit selective, I'm sorry. Um, so I would start with the question from Nick that I think um, matters for all of us, because Nick is asking, during the COVID-19 pandemic, social gatherings have been discouraged or banned. How can arts-based inter interventions help people during this time without the ability of bringing people together? This came through Twitter. So whoever feels like um, responding to that, please speak up now. And I add a second question um, while you are thinking about your answer. And this question goes directly to Stephen and to Grace. 
Um, the question comes from Laura through Twitter as well, and she asks, the arts can sometimes evoke negative emotions. How can art therapists ensure positive outcomes from integrating of the arts in their practice? So who would like to be first? Um, I can, Steven, thank you. I can take a... Um, uh, an attempt at that. Um, negative emotions uh, within the arts therapies aren't something that we necessarily try to avoid, um, but that we train carefully for to be able to hold and contain. And we have a great deal of confidence in the arts and being able to help us move those negative emotions out through our bodies in the, in the mediums that we're using. So if we're using the visual arts, it takes visual form. If we're using dance, it comes out through our body. Um, so the the preparation uh, is really what makes the difference in being able to help and support people through the expression of of those emotions that ultimately do need to find an exit. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Grace, would you also comment on that? I agree with Stephen. Also, I think preparation is the most important thing. And also for us, uh, every workshop or everything that we start with we work closely with uh, medical staff. Uh, we know very well uh, with everyone uh, joining the class. So I think this is very important for them to have their emotion outlet. Um, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but, um, but like Steven said, uh, they all can be absorbed and then all can be um, deal with, yeah. Thank you, Grace. Um, and now to all of you, the COVID-19 question. We cannot dance together. We cannot sweat together at the moment. So what can we do to, to, to survive this pandemic in this very um, disembodied situation? What are your strategies? What are your ideas? What can bring us into the future? There's one uh, example that I would like to share from India. And this is to do with artists themselves. Uh, a lot of artists, as soon as the pandemic hit the country, a lot of artists went into relief work immediately because the government was doing very little. Uh, and many of them very soon were burnt out. They felt exhausted and they felt isolated. Uh, what they did is they created an online space for themselves. A few of them got together and this would be word of mouth. So you could just come into a Zoom room and share with each other how you were feeling. There was no expectations. There were no, um, there was nothing stopping you. The only expectation was that the discussions in that room would not be discussed outside. And you shared a space of, uh, and a lot of those conversations were around isolation, loneliness, and just being able to share that we were all in the same boat. I think it hugely helped the artist community to deal with their own uh, sense of separation from each other and their art forms. Thank you, Arundhati. Anyone else would like to bring in some ideas? Um, Nadine, I would yes, just please. share that um, at the Hopkins Center for the Arts at Dartmouth, we've created a, uh, a virtual stage, a virtual space to attempt to, rec to recreate the experiences that would happen live in our building, but online. And that includes uh, craft workshops uh, with found materials in your own home. It includes uh, dance parties uh, where uh, you know music is offered and people can find joy. Um, there's plenty of opportunities, I think, for therapy and resources for healing. But our strategy was was basically to create an online space for community convening and joyful exchange. Um, and uh, I'm happy to put the uh, link in the chat if anyone wants to see the offerings there. We also offer films and chats as it relates to conversations around the films. So just being together. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Another question is more um, about artists um, 
art-based research method, methods, sorry. So Alize asks via Zoom if there has been any pushback from the scientific community with regards to adding art-based methods to mental health um, research. And the second question goes in a similar direction. She also asked, are there any examples of contribution, contributions of art-based research in improving knowledge and understanding, understanding of mental health and mental illnesses. So I think that could also go to, yeah, who would like to answer? Maybe Jennifer or Mary Lou again, Stephen probably, or maybe you, you would like to say something about that as well, Willie. Yes. If the, sorry, I mean the health have been the, the mental health have we have been getting more research about this because before you get the practices we, we didn't know what we are going to deal with so before you get engaged with the uh, the, 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 the those platform and things you have to make researchers to know how you're gonna deal with this so I think you have been helping us to get more knowledge on this mental health and also illness and to understand it more because mostly on my side, I didn't know more, many of those illness and yeah. Thank you, Willie. I think this is a very important aspect that art also produces knowledge and art also produces knowledge about mental health and well-being. Maybe um, someone else would like to comment on that how research is also part of the whole endeavor. I could say something. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, so maybe an example from real life is that we work with the police where we were spent two months um, in one of their, uh, uh, where they arrest people and keep them in holding cells. Uh, because a lot of people who are in psychosis end up in jail and it's like a revolving door and there's no solution. And uh, after just being there for eight weeks, for two afternoons a week, uh, we have data that showed that before that we were there, the average amount of emergency doctors being called uh, in recognizing psychosis was three per month. And after we were there, it went up to 26 times a month. So <clears throat> that's real data in that we are helping people, officers understand the subjective experiences, learning how to recognize them, and that people are getting actual help instead of being put in holding cells. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's time for one more comment uh, or one more contribution. Maybe there's someone who feels strongly that something needs to be said or needs to be commented on or needs to be shared with us and the audience. Please, the floor is yours. Don't be shy. I don't okay, want to have everybody. The, I don't want to have oh, the yes. last word, but I'll just <laughs> I'll just say that um, there has been such a rich body of evidence from across the world in terms of how the arts and health uh, improve people's lives. Whether we're talking about qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods, community-driven exhibitions, um, it's inexhaustible. The World Health Organization released a scoping review in 2019. Um, showing gold standard uh, evidence again from, from across the globe. Uh, so pushback did exist. I believe that that pushback is starting to break down and uh, the more doctors dancing, uh, the less pushback we'll get. Thank you, Stephen, for this, uh, not the last word, but one of those. Dancing doctors, that's a beautiful image. I would love to all Imagine that now in, in our heads. And I would also love to invite all of you, dear audience out there in the world and all the po people here in, in Rwanda to maybe um, just go and, and have a look at one artwork this weekend. So may it be a, a painting, a dance, a song, or whatever you would like to, to do. And maybe share that with your loved ones, with your friends, and, or maybe with the digital audience out there. So let's um, celebrate the arts and let's all be well. 
Um, with these words, I would love to close this panel. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you all, dear speakers, for your wonderful contributions. And thank you all for your patience with our little digital hiccups. And I'm sure the next panel will be as great at di at like this one. And have a wonderful day, rest of the day, evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are on the world right now. Thank you. As we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors and we we're also exploring the role of culture uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, these are everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. Uh, Yabaru Kwandika, Yabaru Gushanya, Buriya, Ibibazo Jumutke, Nabjo Ubuhanzi, Shora Kongera, Pudirangumu, as we know. My hope is the festival will um, foster understanding, collaboration uh, between the different uh, healthcare sectors, and the different artists. <music>
the speakers are going to be sharing on how women use creativity and art to tackle and talk about their specific mental health journeys. I personally use a creative writing. Tell us also like which form of art do you like to use the most? But more specifically, today's conversation, our next conversation, is going to be exploring gender and as a, a key determinant of health and why women are more affected by mental health issues generally and how that also reflects in our lives and in the lives of the children. We are also going to be talking about how can we analyze how creatives and uh, art are used as an avenue for women to heal, but also to discuss about mental health. So without any further ado, I'm going to be introducing uh, the moderator for the next uh, session, Gira Mata, who is a Rwandan PhD candidate in gender and women's studies at uh, the University of Arizona. She graduated with, in, with a bachelor's degree in development economics and a policy as well as gender, women and sexuality studies from DePaul University. She is a teaching artist, assistant and research assistant in gender and women's studies and a graduate associate at Arizona Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. She is the founder of Sister Circle Collective, the, black, the first black feminist organization in Rwanda analyzing issues of gender inequality through race, race through colonization, class, and sexuality, as well as uh, the founder of Rwanda's first and only all black women and black feminist library, Kamariza Reads. Additionally, Amata is a storyteller and a poet. Amata has done work across the US, South Africa, Uganda, and Rwanda. Her work is about black women's voices and experiences being humanized, changing the narrative surrounding the images, but also reclaiming their power as knowers. Thank you very much. Her work started as we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors and we we're also exploring the role of culture uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, these are everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. I was working with my friends, I was working with my sekta yacu kandi mu buryo buteguye neza twumbishe bidushimishije yaba ari ukwandika yaba ari gushanya buriya ibibazo byo mu mutwe nabyo ubuhanzi bishobora kongera kugira ngo umuntu asubire mu buzima busanzwe my hope is the festival will um, foster understanding collaboration uh, between the different uh, healthcare sectors the different artists Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us um, for this panel on gender, women, and mental health. To begin this panel, I want to like to kind of get an outlook on why this topic is very important. I'm sure many of us have seen this picture of a woman carrying a baby on the back, holding another one by the hand behind, with a bath, uh, bucket of water on her head and a cup of tea in the other arm. Then we've seen another picture of a woman standing by the stove cooking with a baby on the back and then reading a book for class. This is a reality for many young women and girls at home. It's been used many times to show quote unquote to show, show, quote unquote, how strong women are, ignoring the social and economic factors that lead women to have to endure this much labor and in turn the mental toll it has on them. I'm of the generation that says, if this is what it means to be strong, I don't want to be strong, I want to leave. My first semester of my PhD program, I took a class on psychoanalysis and I was reunited with the work of Sigmund Freud after so long abandoning it because I was of the notion that we cannot speak to mental health without addressing the structural and systemic ways it affects women. For example, 
The World Health Organization notes that more women are diagnosed with mental health disorders. 29% of women compared to 17% of men are treated to mental health disorders. They are also likely to be prescribed medication. Even so, they tend to underreport mental health illness. Gender norms, expectations, and practices such as societal stresses, labor, and economic differences in the public and private sphere, power relation, and responsibilities shape the divergent psychological troubles of men and women. Key to these discussions and this particular panel is working towards diligently highlighting and understanding these gender-based factors, destigmatizing mental health, and equally important, making it accessible to all. In order to do this though, we must invest in understanding our community in depth so as to offer the resources and tackle the existing issues. Today for our panel, we'll be joined by Etinosa, Zura, and Sion. And I would like to introduce the three panelists. Etinosa Yvonne is a documentary photographer and visual artist brought and brought up in Nigeria. She works with various art forms, including photos and videos. Etinosa leverages on the power of storytelling to create awareness, educate, inform, question as well as express herself. Etinosa is one of six talents selected for the 2020 cycle of World Press Photo 6x6, Africa Talent. She has received grants for from Women Photograph National Geographic in, in partnership with Lagos Photo and Access Bank Art for her project. It's all in my head. Etinosa's photos have been exhibited internationally. Her works have also been published in several international publications. Etinosa currently resides in Abuja, Nigeria. Zura Vanessa Mutesi is a mental health advocate, communications enthusiast, and music fanatic. She is a Rwandan blogger who is passionate about pushing for awareness of mental health in Rwanda and Africa at large. Her blog, Zura Unfiltered, touches on the personal mental health experiences and how those have shaped her outlook on things mental health related. Zuba's passion for writing fused with her experiences have enabled her to be an advocate for mental health issues in, young, in, her, in the youth through her personal platforms. Outside of her blog, Zuba is a university student pursuing a degree in communication with a concentration in gender and women's studies. Outside of her advocacy, writing and school, Zuba enjoys writing poetry, listening to music, and spending time with her loved ones. Sion Johannes Walker is a part of UGHE as the faculty and the chair of the Center of, for Gender Equity. Sion is responsible for mainstreaming gender in the academic, research, and community development projects of UGHE. Before this role, Sion was engaged in the UGHE as the chief organizer for women leaders in global health conferences 2019. Prior to joining the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, Sion was engaged in production of preliminary gender profile of Ethiopia and a national assessment on accessibility and availability of rehabilitative and reintegration services for survivors of violence for UN women in Ethiopia. She has also been working for 16 years as a gender expert, a consultant with a number of international and non-governmental organizations, as well as governmental organizations through participating in community engagement projects, conducting researches, evaluation, gender analysis, audit, and impact assessments in relation to various thematic areas such as reproductive health, child rights, and other development issues. And welcome. We would like to start off by giving a chance to the panelists to kind of introduce themselves as well as what they hoped to gain from this panel. 
and the discussion and why they think the topic is important. We'll go ahead and start with Sion. Thank you um, for having me here. Uh, mine will be uh, an introductory session on uh, the gender and social determinant determinants of mental health. Uh, that is what kind of gender issues affect women's mental health, uh, issues to do with power, perception, income, and so on, uh, so that uh, you'll understand that the challenges women are, have are different from the, chal the challenges that uh, men have. So I look forward to um, this session and the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sion, and we look forward to um, hearing those insights that you will be providing us with. And we'll go ahead and see what Suba has to say. Thank you so much. Um, as Jamata mentioned, I am a mental health advocate, particularly in African society, as I believe it's an important conversation to have. And especially when it comes to women, young women across the continent, I don't believe we're given enough space to discuss all the different things that, that relate to mental health and the mental spaces because people forget that the mind is the one place you constantly live. And if you don't give them the spaces to discuss how to better their mental environment and in essence, the environments we live in, then is going to be a constant cycle of dissatisfaction. So I believe that out of this whole panel, I think it's important that people highlight that it's not just a women's issue. It's just that a lot of people don't give the space for women to advocate and to express how mental health manifests itself in our lives and how that in turn manifests itself in the societies that uh, we live in. Absolutely, I look forward to that, thank you. And we'll go ahead and see um, what our next speaker has to offer us today in terms of an introductory. Um, Etinosa, welcome you. Hey, thank you for teaching about <clears throat> mental health in Nigeria and uh, how this, uh, we're doing not, we're not doing so much and how much work needs to be done. Um, especially um, when we talk about it as an artist and how I'm trying to use my arts to raise awareness about um, some of the issues, um, um, the mental health challenges that um, people face, especially people who live in rural and um, semi-urban spaces because some things I've noticed is when we talk about mental health, these are people that are left, you know, they are not carried along in this conversation. Uh, most times people that, you know, champion conversations around mental health are mostly millennials in the urban spaces. So I'm seeing how we can bridge that gap because everyone needs to be carried along. Mental health is real. Um, you know, people that um, often go through these challenges, some of them unfortunately don't even understand what they're going through. So. Yeah, I'll definitely be talking about um, you know that, and to be, and I'm also really very happy to be a part of this discussion because it's very important. I'm happy that you know as Africans we're having this type of discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I really do look forward to this panel. Um, I feel like the panelists are bringing forward the different ways that we can analyze gender in and mental health bringing into a concept of, you know, um, class as, as a factor that also affects gender, um, as well as um, looking at the way Africa and social and socioeconomic ways of viewing mental health. So our beginning question, I think, um, is the question that most of us would want to start with when we're thinking about gender, women, and mental health. Um, in society, women are constantly made to police their emotions. We are meant to be strong, never tired, and we're meant to carry the world on our backs and sacrifice ourselves. Um, many times, society defines what it means to be a woman in, ve in various ways it affects our mental health. The, so the social controlling images and social expectations do then fuel the mental toll that it takes on us. 
what are some of the social stigmas of women that you believe contribute to the mental health illnesses that women face in our society? And what do you think can be done about this? We'll start with Zura. Thank you so much. That's such a packed question because it touches on such important things. Like you said, women are seen as the protectors, the nurturers, the, the cornerstones of family, society as a whole. And that in itself is a lot of pressure. So when you put that kind of pressure on someone, but you don't give them the space to maybe offload or feel like they, they're allowed to have a day of feeling bad, then it's bound to continue this cycle of, of women constantly pushing the agenda, but not given the space to kind of um, discuss the things that affect them as well. And I think one of the things, especially uh, speaking on African culture, one of the things that's going to help us push this mental health agenda forward is breaking ourselves free from uh, culture's shackles. Because I feel like a lot of times there's excuses that are made in the name of culture. Um, for example, in Rwandan culture, there's certain ways a female is supposed to look, to dress, to talk. And, and all of these uh, expectations weigh heavy on a lot of people. And when you don't meet those expectations, you're bound to feel like subpar or you're not meeting some sort of standard. And the important thing to realize is that you are your own standard. You can't um, expect to get your your compass of, of who you're supposed to be based on gender norms or based on cultural norms. So I think the one thing that's going to point us in the, in the best direction, number one, is awareness of the fact that these spaces are not available. The fact that women too need to have a, a space to offload to express themselves in the most, in the most raw form possible. And once we get there, I feel like there's more going to be done in terms of how society treats people, even um, in, in like socioeconomic classes. I feel like it all starts with awareness and acknowledgement of the fact that we don't have these spaces and these spaces need to be created for us and by us. Absolutely. Um, we'll go ahead and hear from Sion um, about the question. Thank you. Yeah, well, as uh, indicated earlier, uh, gender is shaped by society uh, and is all about norms, um, perceptions, values, and how this affects uh, access, control, decision-making power, etc. And uh, just like there are a range of factors that um, affect gender, there are also factors what we call social determinants of health that affect access to um, health and the people's well-being in general. So um, when, we look, when we look at women's um, mental health, we can uh, talk about uh, the division of labor in communities and also in households, uh, their access to services, uh, this, their decision-making roles, and community uh, perceptions and so on, and uh, how all this affects women's mental health. Uh, we have literature, various literature, I'll, I'll share uh, some of the links later, uh, that indicates that women suffer uh, more from mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety disorders, uh, bipolar disorder, uh, eating disorders, substance abuse disorders, etc. And um, you know, this shows us that there are uh, gender differences in some specific mental health issues. So uh, it is important why uh, that is, what, what the root cause of that is. So uh, one thing we can do is research more, research, research, um, bring in women's voices into uh, what is being studied, make them part of the design of projects, uh, you know, engage them as artists, as service providers, and so on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and Etinosa, um, can you please let us know what you think about the social stigmas that women um, face in society and how they contribute to their mental health? Thank you. So I'm going to speak, um, you know, as a Nigerian that has worked with women, especially women who have um, survived gender-based violence. Um, in a society, to a very large extent here in Nigeria, in some parts of Nigeria uh, and 
of course, it's shaped by the way that the larger society sees women. Women are viewed as objects. And um, it goes a long way to in the way that, you know, the women that are treated, the way that um, women have no say in, especially in, in different aspects of our society. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, we'll go ahead um, to the next question. One of the stigmas that we have attached to women is that they are all childbearing. Um, no, not all women want to give birth, that's for one. Not all can give birth and not all do give birth and not all have uteruses. However, the social expectation is that you must give birth and after you do, your child becomes your whole life and then you cease to be your own independent person. One of the mental health illnesses that we see a lot in our communities in Africa is that of postpartum. Can you speak to the ways in which our society views these issues of postpartum, whether they're talked about, and how can we begin to address them as a way to bring in the conversation as gender, as a, as a social determinant to mental health? We'll go ahead and start with Sion as a person who does this in their work, um, both academically and also within the working field. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I'd like um, to say that there's a lot that needs to be done to address these issues, you know, uh, starting uh, from um, um, creating awareness, not only um, among women, but communities awareness, and then uh, changing their women's image, valuing their roles, be it in productive, their uh, reproductive or community management activities, most of which are not usually valued and recognized. Uh, women giving them um, or have enabling them to have the decision-making power means uh, having the power to decide on whether to have children or not. That comes under reproductive health rights. Um, acknowledging that postpartum uh, depression is not um, unique to uh, few women because that's the feeling many women also have uh, acknowledging the problem and uh, giving the, the relevant support from family members is also important. So, uh, you know, there's an, a, lot, a, no, a lot needs to be done in terms of awareness creation at different levels on this issue. Ziva, do you want to talk about this? I think that uh, the point on awareness is very important. I feel like in African society at large, we don't discuss postpartum depression. It's not something that, is commonly talked about or taught. And I feel that also that ties to how we educate women to have autonomy over their body. In like uh, Etinosa said, it, that women are viewed as objects. And when you put a woman in a box of childbearing, that's objectifying her as just a child bear. She's just there to bear children, but women are more than that. We're seeing women doing all sorts of things in society and breaking glass ceilings and so on and so forth. So I think that the more we educate women themselves, especially in societies where these conversations are not uh, common, the more we educate women about their autonomy in terms of their body and how they control it, as well as their mental space, then I feel like that pushes the agenda forward of addressing the communities that they live within. Because I feel like once the women understand where they should stand and how, and how they should stand up for themselves, then that kind of becomes a domino effect. Because once you put a standard forward, people have no option but to live to that standard or move aside. And if women become more aware of these things, then we're going to set the standard of the fact that this is how it is, this is the spaces we deserve, that we need. And once that is set, you can't really push that back because once we build a strong fort, they can't really push us back anymore. Absolutely. Um, Etinosa, do you have anything to add to our, our discussion right now? Um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I feel like my connection is really bad. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so I actually didn't hear your question because my internet went off. So can you, yeah. can you recap? Can you say that again, your question? Yes. Mm, so I was asking, um, can you speak to the ways in which our society views and talks about postpartum and the stereotype of women being solely for childbearing and how we can begin to address this as something vital when we're speaking to mental health of women okay so for example um postpartum depression is a lot of it's something that i have seen women actually go through life dealing with without actually having to talk to anybody about it because um first and foremost we know that especially in like i do i would i don't want to say the african society but in the nigerian society where uh, we're very spiritual you know um when a woman has you know a postpartum depression she's you know she's encouraged to probably go to church or go to mosque or whatever for prayers so you see these women i have i've actually you know worked with women who have gone through this and it is during the times that we're having our discussion um, or interviews that they find out that these are the kind of conditions that you know they're living with but unfortunately because of the way that you know the burden that their family their society have put on them they never even understood the conviction conditions that they're actually living with and then um, they go through life being burdened with all of these things, going through uh, sadness, they can't talk about it. Um, I think that we have so much work to do, you know. I think every time that I go to the field, I'm reminded of how much, you know, how much work that needs to be done in terms of educating people. I'm all for, you know, educating at the grassroots level, kind from starting from when the kids are small up until when they're big. And also, I mean, one of the things I always say, we get when you talk about gender, especially when we talk about women, I also feel like the only way that we can start to get things right and see improvements in terms of the way that, you know, mental health and all of these burdens that are placed on women is when we also, to a very large extent, start to carry these men along. Um, I've worked with people and it's one of the things I always recommend where I see like men are left behind and somehow they start to take their anger on the women without having to understand some of the things that the women um, are going to so education would you know would go a long way in actually helping um hello can you hear me yes we can hear you okay. yeah education would go a long way in helping you know to de demystify some of these things that women go through actually to help in actually improving the mental if the men are educated if the boys are educated because the boys grow and become men and then we can be able to break, break this vicious cycle because if we continue to just focus on educating women explaining to them some of the things that their bodies do to them when they go through you know childbirth and all of that and we do not carry their partners along then we are still leaving a gap so we need to be able to carry the two of them along you know just like when we talk about um reproductive um, health, when we talk about family plan, you just don't, you know, for example, here in Nigeria, if you want to get family plan, you have to, for, to an extent for now, you have to, if you're married, you have to go to the husband and the husband has to give approval. Not like I'm in total, I'm supporting that, but I'm saying that the husband has to understand what is going on. So to an extent, the men need to understand what these women are going through. You know, they need to understand the things that come with, you know, childbirth. These are the kind of uh, conditions that, that happen, this is how you treat your wife when you notice things like that, instead of having to beat her or having to drive her out of your house. When they have an understanding of some of these issues, then they'll be able to handle things better. When also, when the society, like the grandmothers, people from the older generation, because I feel like a lot of this conversation we have is because you know we're exposed and we're educated, but to be able to carry the older generation and also, um, you know, people who are not so literate are long, but to really help. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can still hear me. I have yes. to keep checking just to be sure that I'm here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We can hear you. And thank you so much for that very detailed and also place specific um, discussion about how um, marriage and raising children and also society, how they put so much pressure on women. Um, and Etinosa, earlier on, you talked about how you work with survivors of violence. And I think one of the important issues that we should talk about when we're talking about gender and mental health is the violence that women face. Um, given that Hangwe Festival is a project created by a university, I wanted us to talk about it in terms of the women who, are, you know, come to universities 
Title IX states that 20 to 25% of female college students will experience sexual assault. Yet more than 20% of campuses do not provide any sexual assault reporting training to staff or faculty. And violence is, uh, the thing about violence is that it leads to chronic physical illness but also a lot of it is mental health issues such as depression and PTSD and suicide assault as well. In what ways does the normalized GBV of women contribute to mental health in our society? And how can we begin to address this in terms of showing it as a social determinant um, when we're speaking to solutions for mental health issues in our community? We'll go ahead and start with Sion. Thank you, yeah. Uh, it's a very important issue uh, to raise right now. Um, you know, uh, we all understand uh, that GBV has a big impact on women's male health, right? And um, especially in times of uh, pandemic, like the current COVID-19 situation, I was also looking at a question on that on the chat box. Um, we have seen how uh, intimate violence against women, that is uh, violence um, committed by intimate partners, has uh, increased across many countries, especially um, in the first months of lockdown when families lost jobs and lived in confined environments for a long time. So that was uh, quite a challenge. And even before the pandemic, you know, um, there were challenges in uh, uh, services, services uh, such rehabilitative and um, uh, rehabilitative services for survivors of violence. For example, uh, in the communities I worked with, with in, back in Ethiopia, uh, there were not enough shelters and one-stop one um, centers, uh, which provided uh, counseling and comprehensive services so, uh, for survivors of violence. And now uh, with the COVID challenge and the increase in domestic violence um, and the increase in uh, early marriage also in some areas, uh, we can imagine how uh, how many women are um, being affected uh, and and this shows us the need to work more uh, the need to raise uh, funds for uh, such programs at present even the need uh, the the importance um, the important role that art can play uh, in creating awareness about this um, like you said reporting mechanisms are also very important they should be accessible at different levels uh, there are also different, uh, I will not go deep into it, but right now there are um, different mechanisms are being used for reporting mechanisms. Um, and in the case of um, academic institutions, uh, just like you said earlier, it's very important to have those uh, reporting mechanisms in place and also to make sure that they are accessible to people of not, not only women, but people of different genders and age. Thank you. Absolutely, that's great. Um, thank you so much for mentioning not just to women, but also to women, to folks of all genders, because that's very important, especially when we're speaking to, um, to a panel like this about gender as something that is socially constructed. Um, I had a question that was more specific to um, to the issues that I saw that Zuba, you like to talk about specifically in your, um, in your blogs and on your social media. Um, here in Rwanda, when you haven't seen someone for a long time, they greet you with co-op here, right? Um, meaning like you've gained weight. Um, physical appearance embedded in desirability politics, fat phobia and so forth affect women more disproportionately than men eating disorders, um, disorder eating, and, and other forms um, of physical appearance, social constraints, right? Um, affect us and also lead to issues such as like suicide, right? So can you speak to the ways in which you find these are connected to gender in mental health why and what can we do to address it, especially for young girls like yourself, but also folks of other genders? Thank you for that question. Um, I th one thing I've maintained with my writing is to be completely raw about such things. And I use my, my personal experiences as the best way to depict that because they say experience is the best teacher. And if I come and tell you, someone told me co-op or 
translation or how come you became so fat, it's not going to sink in because to you, it may be something so sly, but we have to realize that different people have different limits. And there's a lot of expectations and burdens in terms of how females should look that are placed on us, especially in, in African society. Now, I'm not saying that in different cultures and, and around the world, this is not apparent. It is, but I'm speaking on what I know. And for me, one of the things that has helped me get to a point where people realize how absurd it is to say that is to keep repeating it to them and, and asking them, if I come and greet you and ask you, why are you fat? <laughs> You're not going to feel good about it. You're not going to, obviously that's going to, touch something in your mind. And if you're someone who's nonchalant to such things, it might be nothing, but we have to be aware of the fact that number one, words carry a lot of power. I feel like people kind of overlook that and try to be like, oh, but you know, it's just a joke, it's just a comment. But these comments manifest themselves in different ways. And that leads to, like you said, different mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and, and even worse to like eating disorders or feeling like you should, like there's something about you that doesn't deserve to be here. So I feel like number one, being very blunt about the disrespect is very important. People kind of ride the culture wave, the respect wave to try and get away from actually tackling the fact that these are things that lead young women to doubt their themselves, their potential, their self-esteem. And it leads to, you know, when, when you hear things like, oh, but you know, so-and-so became like this and so-and-so did this it's because there must have been something and there's a limit that was pushed for them to result to that. So until people can actually be blunt about having such conversations and calling people out, because you have to hold people accountable for, for their actions and their words, accountability breeds responsibility. So until we hold people accountable to the things they say and what they may lead to, then this is going to be a cycle. So we have to breathe this sense of responsibility over the expectations that we set over young women, particularly when it comes to the way they look. And for any young woman out there, trust me, there's no such thing as perfect beauty. Perfect according to who? According to what? There's no standard. You are your own standard. So I feel like for young women, they have to set that tone forward for them and kind of break themselves out of the idea that females are supposed to be meek and humble and you know clean pristine that's all great if that's the type of person you are good but if if that's what's holding you back then it's important to have the conversations and hold people accountable for their actions in how they make this domino effect of having small comments like those about people's bodies manifest into people having eating disorders and having anxiety, panic attacks, and all of that that comes after. So I feel like number one, we need to breed a culture of accountability and people are gonna start being more responsible for, for the expectations they set and the standards they set forward for not just young women, but even uh, men, non-binary, everyone falls under that bracket. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I think the last question I'm going to be asking any of the panels you can chip in on this. Um, we cannot speak to mental health and gender um, only from the side of the receiver. We must also speak to it in terms of service providers as well as the field in itself. When I first got a therapist, she was a black woman and we spoke about the importance of being compatible and being intentional about the therapist that you get. They must be a fit to you as much as you are a fit to them. That is in terms of identity politics, in terms of experiences and so forth, because they do determine who you are, determines how you experience the world and how the world experiences you. Um, However, we see that the field continues to be professionally dominated by men and by non-Black people. 
So do you think the lack of women in this field contributes to how we address gender in the mental health as well as um, do you think that um, Do you think it contributes, it contributes to the gender disparities that we see in mental health in terms of reporting and also gaining um, uh, medication? And why do you think it's important to have women therapists, black women therapists, Rwandan, African women therapists, psychologists and psychoanalysts? I, from my first therapy experience it was a white male and it was, it took time to find a point of relation or comfort in that environment because there's so many experiences I would speak to that you cannot relate to. And I understand as a therapist, most of the time, it's not about finding a point of relation, but that can be very crucial to having a breakthrough towards someone's mental space. So I think that the more we have people that understand our struggle, like I can't tell you my struggle as a black woman to a white woman and you understand it. It's not gonna happen because though we live in the same world and same environment, the resources you have, the outlook society has of you is a polar opposite to what it has of me. So I think that the more we start creating spaces for us and by us, then we can build uh, a sense of comfort and a sense of re uh, relatability for people to feel like th they can engage in those spaces. Because if I put you in an environment where you feel like someone can't really connect to your experiences, that's gonna be an additional barrier to what you're actually trying to seek. So I feel like the more we start looking into creating spaces tailored to us, tailored to the experience that different um, cultures, different genders, races, ETC, face, then the more we can find more people to feed into this. Because once we have um, those conversations and once we start setting the scene of building these environments for ourselves, such as even this panel, it's because we've created a, a, an environment where we can relate on all things gender, mental health, and all of that. So once we find a point of relatability, there's going to be a change. So I feel like number one, there needs to be conversations about the spaces we lack, acknowledgement of the fact that we lack these spaces and we lack these resources and people to feed into it, then we start looking for those solutions. But at the end of the day, for me personally, I would love to see more spaces that are designed for us and by us because no one is going to understand our experience more than us. Um, Etinosa, would you like to speak to that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for me, one of the things I would say is in a society where people don't even, uh, you know, understand mental health issues, when you now start to have that conversation around if women are even like, you know, therapists, it's, it's like that, that conversation will not even come in yet because the first things first, how many of these people recognize that mental health issues are real issues, you know? It's just like, unfortunately, to an extent, because mental health issues cannot be seen. It's just like when you have malaria or when you have a headache, you can, people can see from your, you know, from the way you are, they can tell that you're not feeling fine. But the one that is, you know, has to do with, you know, it's just a state of the mind is going on in your head. When people don't, to an extent, I'm talking as a Nigerian, when people don't recognize that these issues are real, when people tend to over spiritualize things, you, you can say to yourself, I'm depressed, and you're, oh no, you shouldn't be depressed, you know, you can pray about it. How do you start to have a conversation on who is going to be championing this kind of conversations, you know? So the first thing will be to, uh, for, I mean, in our society, to be, to raise more awareness around how, make people, educate people, on, you know, on what mental health issues are. Because, you know, I've had discussions, I think maybe working on my own personal project sort of opened my eyes to understanding mental health issues. I'm not here to actually um, talk down anybody because I used to think like the average Nigerian where, you know, when people present themselves with mental health issues, we would say, you know, go to church or whatever, until I started to work on my project. And then, you know, I understood that these are real issues. You know, we cannot see it, but they exist. 
it is only when we start to educate ourselves, we start to have these conversations, like, you know, she was saying, when we start to have these conversations, when we start to, you know, it becomes a part of us, when we recognize that when the society stops putting pressure on, for example, uh, men, when they say, be a man about it, you know, when a woman presents herself with mental issues and people can recognize that she has issues, then we can now say, okay, who are the people that are going to be training? Who are the therapists? How can we start to train uh, more therapists? How can we have more women therapists? I think because I work in uh, a lot in the, you know, the development space, I work with women who are in conflict region. Um, the type of issues that they have, to an extent, when I see that you know, they are being counseled by a man, it hurts me, but unfortunately, when it is the reality is that these are the only people available to counsel them you know but when we have this conversation for example when we sit down amongst ourselves we're women and we're talking you see how they express themselves freely because there are some of the things that they go through that these men would never 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 understand um so i think for me to be that we need a lot of education we need a lot of intentionality in the society Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, we have a Zoom question for Sion, and we would like to ask you as you go forward to respond. Um, how can people who identify as male become allies in changing the conditions that make gender a mental health determinant for women? Yeah, I think um, men, women, and others all have a role can contribute to uh, women's mental health. Uh, they can be mindful of women's needs, um, what are what are, uh, women's challenges are and so on. Um, but again, going back into the earlier question, I would uh, I want to talk a bit about it, uh, the, the, what you said about female therapists. Um, um, you, that, you know, the context is different from country to um, country. It's very important to have women service providers. Example, in the case of sexual and gender-based violence, uh, that is really uh, very important. That was done in the shelters I visited uh, in Ethiopia. And um, I, I noted how it is essential for women who are suffering from trauma and effects of violence to be uh, treated or to, um, to, to be working with other women. Uh, but some literature also indicates that there are uh, more female counselors than uh, main, male female than male counselors in some countries, for which uh, I found data. So we have to look at whether uh, this is the reality everywhere across countries or by type of cases. But again, going back into the, the issue, I, I would want to ask: uh, Do women have the financial capacity to have access to these services? Is this service free? Uh, who um, in our societies are, has more access to healthcare services, you know, uh, who has the financial capacity, who makes the decision. So here the question about other community members taking part in um, supporting women comes. Uh, we all know that women are the most affected by poverty. 70% uh, of the world's poor are women. They earn much less than men. Uh, so, um, and they have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of burdens in the household. Um, they have limited access to income generating opportunities and so on. So all, all members of the society, be it women, men, other genders, they have a responsibility uh, in supporting women, I recognizing their, their, uh, that their, they don't have the same challenge as other genders and, um, you know, uh, supporting this cause through whatever they do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe, uh, Sion, you have something for us. It, yes, we have something to be shown to us um, right now before we end our panel um, and you will be speaking to it. Okay. Can I speak? Absolutely, yes. Go ahead, Tinosa. All right, so 
Um, I'm very happy to be able to present this work. The title of this project is, uh, it's a multimedia project, it's called It's All In My Head. Um, it's an ongoing project that explores the coping mechanisms of survivors of terrorism and violent conflict in Nigeria. Um, I started to work on the project because I wanted to be able, I mean, I was concerned about how people, how these people who once had life, you know, find they were living their life, how everything was going on well for them. And all of a sudden, all has been taken away from them. They have to live in this you know, really terrible camps and, you know, they have to start to adjust to their new realities. One of the things I wanted to inquire, I wanted to find out was how were they coping mentally? What was going on in their head? Because I, I, I noticed that the things that we do is to focus, especially here, the focus on giving them makeshift camps, setting up clinics and all of that. But nobody was really, I mean, very few organizations were paying attention to their mental health, which is actually very important. So I started to have these conversations. I initially started working with survivors of um, terrorism and violent conflict. And then as I moved on, I realized that, you know, it occurred to me that one of the challenges we have as a country in Nigeria is that we always have um, different types of violent conflicts on, on a yearly basis, actually. I, I don't want to say almost on a yearly basis, but it happens every year. And I wanted to understand, you know, what's going on in their head. They have seen their loved ones being killed, properties, you know, are they moving on? If they are moving, things that they hold on to, what are their coping mechanisms? Um, so yes, here is Hajaga Abubaka. Um, she's from, originally from Bonneville. She um, was residing in uh, Abuja. One of the things I started to do with this image, uh, project, one of the things I, I wanted to achieve was to be able to show people what's going on in their minds. I had to think deeply of how I was going to present this work because I didn't want to do, you know, just your regular portraiture and compose it well to say, oh, mental health. I wanted you to look at these images and be able to see what's going on. I wanted to draw people into the state of the mind of the survivors. Uh, we can go into the next image. Um, I met um, Mama Margaret Fidelis in, uh, in uh, Michika. Michika is in Adama, which is in the northeastern part of Nigeria. It also has been ravaged by insurgents. And uh, she found her husband. Uh, I'm sorry, these are sad stories. So I'm, I'm really sorry. Just a warning for everyone in the audience. Um, she found that her husband's head had been cut off and, you know, all her life when she was married, she was married for 30 years before the insurgents, you know, killed her husband. She never had to work. She was actually a princess when she was, when her husband was alive. And then all of a sudden, everything changed when the insurgents attacked um, Michika in Adamawa in 20, 2014, 2015. And, you know, she said to me that she feels like her world has come upside down. One of the things I do with this work is to be able to visually represent the way that they feel. Because when you go into a community and you start to have this conversation, you realize that their experiences are almost the same, you know, especially they were there the same day the conflict happened or whatever happened. But the way that each person processes the experience is different. So with this project, one of the things I always do is how to individually depict, depict um, each person's feelings. So if they say they feel sadness, how do I show sadness? Because you can have 10 people show sadness, but the way that each person's sadness, you know, each person carries that sadness is different. Um, so here you see a crown um, and it's upside down because, you know, her world is upside down. Uh, someone who had gone through life, not having to raise a finger, she had everything done for her. And in one day, not only was her husband taken away from her, she had to start to live in these really terrible camps. Uh, she had to be the one to bury her husband who was beheaded. So she had to take the, the head and the body, and, you know. Um, yeah, so let's go to the next image. Um, I work on this project in different parts of Nigeria. Another, one of the reasons that I didn't want to only work, you know, focus on survivors of terrorism, the Boko Haram insurgency was because, you know, it feels like it's just a stereotype and it feels like we're just amplifying, we're just focusing on one thing. Meanwhile, in different parts of the country, we're having different types of conflict and year in year out, these people are forced to, you know, move on with their life. And to a very large extent, one of the things I know as a Nigerian is that 
you know, I grew up in Lagos and it was, it was only when I started to live in Abuja, I started to understand certain things that happen in, you know, in like the northern part of Nigeria. Nigeria, the average Nigerian is only connected to what they can see. So if something is happening down south, most likely people in the east might not be very genuinely concerned about it. People in the north might not be genuinely concerned about it. Something is happening down north. People in the south might not be concerned about it. So I try to you know, see how I can use this project to bridge that gap, to let everybody know what's going on in the country and see how we can, you know, um, provide, um, help the people who, are, these people who have um, survived this type of conflict. Um, I'm also trying to see how we can be able to build um, support system amongst themselves. Because whenever I go for, you know, research for this project, I've noticed that a lot of people regardless of we don't even talk amongst them that we've tried the, when we think it is for them because they find that and then you see them advising each other so it's that type of thing that i'm conversing for to see how can we build support support groups amongst these people so that they can be you know a, a source of healing for each other we can go to the next picture hi can you hear me? Oh, shit. Yes, we can hear you, but Etisona, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, these resources, I'm hoping they will be available for the community, um, for those who would like to continue to see this project. It's all in my head uh, by Etinosa. Please do contact UGHE. I just want to come forward and say thank you so much for tuning in and thank you so much to our panelists, Etisona all the way from Nigeria and Sion all the way from Ethiopia, as well as Zuba with us here in Rwanda. Um, on this panel about women, gender and mental health, there are different ways that we can tackle mental health because there are different factors that do influence the ways in which we experience the world. And in order for us to be able to properly address these issues, as well as provide resources that are accessible to all, it is in making sure that we understand the ways that they are living within the community. Whether we're thinking about socioeconomic class, whether we're thinking about gender, whether we're thinking about sexuality, ability, religion, as well as nationhood. Um, and most importantly, it's also our responsibility, particularly as African women, to think about mental health in a decolonial framework, because it gives us the, the tools to start to think about art as a way to contribute to healing, but and also to think about critical trauma studies for folks who are coming in thinking about PTSD, but also thinking about war, thinking about genocide, and thinking about the different violences that women and folks of other genders face in our community. This is just a call so that we're all making sure when we're thinking about mental health, that we're thinking about these in frameworks that are are place specific, but also are experience specific in order for us to be able to achieve our goal to destigmatize me mental health, but also give these resources to people. So thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy all the other sessions that Hamia Festival has for you, and as well as their knowledge and the wisdom that will be coming forward from our other panelists. Thank you. Her work started as we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors and we we're also exploring the role of culture uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, these are everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. Uh, Yabaru Kwandika, Yabaru Gushanya, Buriya, Ibibazo Jumu Mutke, Nabjo Ubuhanzi, Shora Kongera, Kudirangomu, as Vire Mozimosa. My hope is the festival will um, foster understanding, collaboration uh, between the different uh, healthcare sectors, the different artists. <music> Thank you.
the COVID living discussion for today. My name is Sharon Kadimba Urusaro, and I am a journalist. I'll be here to discuss some of the COVID living coping mechanisms together with the flying objects from the Welcome Trust team. And I'll be happy to introduce to you some of my panelists for today. And that is Professor Miranda Wolpert. She is a clinical psychologist by background, and she's committed to understanding how best to support and evaluate effective service delivery to promote resilience and meet children and young people's mental health needs. Her work focuses on improvement and prevention, science combined with social entrepreneurship, and includes the development of online, digital, and face-to-face -face and training resources for young people, carers, and practitioners. Miranda Wolpert. Hi, lovely to be here. You're welcome, Miranda. And my other panelist is Grace Gatera, and she is a lived experienced mental health an NCD's advocate living in Kigali, Rwanda. She works as an advisor for the Welcome Trust Mental Health Priority Area and is a commissioner of the Lancet Commissioner on, Commission on Gender-Based Violence and Maltreatment and is also a young leader for global health, mental health and sustainable development. She is passionate about meaningful youth involvement, particularly for under-resourced, underrepresented, and least hard populations in the world. Hello, Grace Gatera. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. And our last panelist for today is Tim Patridge, who is the co-founder and creative director of Flying Object, a London-based studio that creates video, experiential, and digital projects. He has specialized in work that uses crowdsourcing and participatory creative methods, such as the film Life in a Day with YouTube and Ridley Scott, London Calling with the Old Vic Theater, and COVID Living with Welcome. How are you, Tim Patridge? Very well, thanks very much, nice to meet you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, on the COVID living project that I was just going through now, we have gone through a few things that people have been doing during this COVID living. And some people have, learning, have been learning how to dance, some have been learning how to write, how to cook, you can name it. People have gone all the way to find a way to live through COVID. And Today, we are going to talk with this wonderful team, and I cannot wait to see what it is that you have gone through this COVID living project with your team of flying objects. And to kick this off, I will start with the presentation from Grace Gatera and Miranda. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to start and then pass on to Grace. Um, so thank you very much for having us here today. This is part of a project uh, done by Welcome uh, and the Welcome Trust, for those who don't know it, we're very proud to be partnering on this festival. And uh, we are a big funder of science research, trying to help ensure that we create a world in which no one is held back by mental health problems. And to do that, we want to bring science and art together we're working with really talented colleagues across Welcome, in particular our colleagues Daniel Olson and Ken Arnold, who lead something called the Mindscapes Programme. And the Mindscapes Programme is this idea of bringing cultural innovation together with scientific insights in a sort of great mashup that gives new insights and new thoughts uh, about how we understand mental health, how we address mental health, and how we can have new conversations between different groups about mental health going forward. One of the things we've been working on with them is trying to understand what, as you've said, uh, what people are doing in the context of COVID to manage their mental health. As those of you who heard me talk yesterday will know, 
Welcome is trying to focus particularly on young people between the ages of 14 and 24 and trying to understand what helps them live with and address and prevent anxiety and depression, which we know many, many, many young people will have at some point or another. And one of the things Welcome believes is we need to think broader than healthcare, wider than the health system. So it includes both healthcare and self-care, but also things that communities and society can do. So this project involved two cultural initiatives, one of which Tim's gonna talk about and one of which I just wanted to mention quickly, which was something called uh, um, uh, Collective Resilience, which was run by two wonderful brothers, uh, Alex and Jules Evans, who tried to look at the different ways people were supporting themselves during this period of uh, lockdown in many countries and uh, the pandemic and found that there were all sorts of ways that communities came together that involved religion and the arts, mutual aid. Um, and just talking about, uh, you mentioned about dancing. One of their interesting facts they found is during the pandemic, people like to download faster down music than during non-pandemic times. So there may be something that we all need to keep ourselves exercising and energetic. I certainly know one of my active ingredients during this time has been watching lots and lots and lots of television. Nothing terribly creative at all, just lots of TV. So I think one of the things we're interested in is can we rigorously study this and can we bring cultural views to this? So at this point, I'm gonna pass over to Grace to talk about her experience in relation to these projects and what she's bringing here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Miranda. I don't have a lot to add, but um, yes, as they said, my name is Grace Catera. I am a lived experience expert advisor for the Wellcome Trust, working particularly in the men uh, mental health priority area with Miranda. She's basically my boss. Um, I have been working with them since April uh, 2020. And as part of my role, I get to be a part of cool things like advise on commission work, so support the setup and implementation of their lived experience strategy, be a part of a, of a network of young change makers across the world, um, just, just doing wonderful things in their communities, but also advising in the mental health priority area. And uh, we also help in informing decisions from thought conception to the actual work. And it's so cool that I'm incredibly uh, privileged to be doing it. Um, this report in particular was informed by perspectives uh, from other lived experience mental health advocates from across the world in countries like China, Indonesia, New Zealand, Ghana, uh, Kyrgyzstan and our very own Rwanda. So I, I collected a few thoughts from uh, my fellow Rwandans as well to, to inform this report. And like everyone has said, uh, we, we came up with a lot of positive things that people had been doing during the, the, uh, the, the lockdown and during this COVID area to, to bring, to find a sense of normalcy in the world. Uh, like you said, dancing was a big part of it. Music was a big part of it. Uh, chatting with uh, with um, with their friends, people phone, creative ways of keeping in touch, including the the up house party, which, as you know, is a house party, um, <laughs> and uh, as and also they they did a lot of online education. I know that I also signed up for a, a lot of courses <laughs> to learn things during this this period. So it was really fantastic to see how much people adapt uh, to to the situation that they're living in. But that's also not to discount, you know, what was happening, uh, the mental health. Uh, challenges that people are facing in these times. Uh, what I can say is that, um, is that we found that despite what was going on, people, people found good. And I think what we need to do is that we should not let, we should not let the world forget that good we found during this time, that unity, that love for art, that love for music. Instead, we should build up on this. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to uh, stop here and pass on to Tim uh, to, to, to share more on COVID living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. Hey, thanks, Grace and Miranda. Um, so I'm going to talk you through the project and sort of give you a bit more context about what we did. Um, and I'll share a few slides and a few examples of, of um, what we got up to as well in a moment. Um, COVID living came about very rapidly um, in the spring of this year. 
um, really as um, the kind of realities of life under the COVID crisis were sort of becoming clear. Um, and uh, Welcome really were motivated to, as quickly as we could really, start gathering experiences of young people around the world to understand how they were coping during this time and the specific things and activities they were trying and successes they were finding um, during this sort of period of lockdown um, as it was kind of happening, you know, throughout the world. Um, so that was our sort of first goal really, was to go out and to talk to and um, collect experiences from, from young people. Um, there were sort of two further goals. The second was around the way that we collected these experiences. Um, one thing that we kind of recognized was actually young people, for many young people, this was a time where they had sort of more time on their hands than they might have ordinarily, and actually were looking for things to do. And we saw actually an opportunity to kind of be more experimental in how we collected experiences from people um, than, than we might ordinarily, ordinarily be able to. So we use different uh, methods such as using WhatsApp, uh, video chat, writing exercises, photography exercises, and I'll, I'll talk through these in a second, um, as a way of collecting these experiences, really in the hope of building a kind of more nuanced and personal perspective on, on kind of what people were doing and how they were coping. Um, and then the third goal was around what we did with this material. I think it's interesting in its own right, but we had a um, hope that we could use this material to create some sort of cultural output, a piece of culture or, or art um, inspired by the material that we, we collected. Um, and uh, that's what we'll finish on today as well and, and sort of show you um, where that's got to as well. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen now just to, um, oh, actually I'm not able to screen share. Is the host able to give me permission to do that? Oh, here we go, thank you. Great. Uh, so, um, so as I mentioned, this was a very kind of rapid project to get going. And unfortunately we weren't sort of able to be kind of scientifically sort of significant in how we kind of collected participants, but we did feel it was important to be as kind of representative and as global as we could sort of under the circumstances. Um, so we put the call out to take part in this through um, dozens of networks um, throughout the world. Uh, we had um, almost 150 people come back to us and say they were interested of which um, around 60 ended up sort of taking part in the project through one, one form or another um, from 14 different countries, um, all kind of having different sort of experiences of lockdown. So um, the kind of global nature of this project sort of was, was sort of really important. And I think it's sort of interesting as we go through this to see while there are obviously differences in how people were experiencing this time, there are actually many more similarities in kind of the people's experiences and, and things they were doing to, to cope as well. Um, I mentioned that we use different ways to collect these experiences and there were three things that we did and, and essentially each person who signed up to take part was was given one of these activities to take part in so the first was using whatsapp uh, whatsapp and other um, messaging apps are obviously very important ways that young people communicate with each other and our sort of hypothesis was if we were to sort of talk to people using whatsapp could we kind of access a more personal, chatty, kind of personal perspective on what they were doing to cope through this time than a kind of more formal interview might. Um, it also enabled us to use all the kind of content creation tools that a, you know, every, you know, a standard smartphone has. So over the course of a three-day conversation, uh, people were sharing um, text, sort of things that they were doing. Uh, this person in India talked about sort of cooking, trying not to read the news too much, uh, trying to work. Um, but they also shared photos. We asked them to each um, take photos over the course of a day and share kind of their experiences and what they were doing. Um, video, uh, voice notes. Uh, this person was doing a lot of art and sort of talked about when they indulged in art, their kind of mind didn't wander to different places and things that made them anxious. And kind of the goal here was really by using all these different um, methods that we could build this almost digital scrapbook of an individual and kind of really get a sense of what their experience was and, and how they were coping during this time. Uh, the second method we used was, was video chat. Um, obviously, Zoom, as we are on now, um, was a key part to how people were communicating with each other um, through lockdown. Um, we wanted to use it in quite a specific way, which was to have people doing the activity that they were finding helpful while they talked to us. Um, and the hope was that kind of by putting them in the mind space of doing that activity and, um, and sort of 
talking us through it, uh, they would be able to sort of really kind of get into some of the specifics and nuances of why they found it found it useful to them. So um, the one you're seeing on screen here was um, uh, a young person in Hong Kong who'd become uh, very interested in model making during, during this time. And so he sort of made a model on video chat while we were talking to him. Um, and at the same time, sort of talked about why model making had become so helpful to him um, in this time. Uh, he sort of said that the ways that usual solutions he used to kind of stay positive were prohibited. So he kind of looked for new ways, um, sort of building models. But we also had someone doing yoga while they talked to us. Uh, we had someone um, painting while they talked to us. Um, we had someone walking while they talked to us. That one didn't work so well. So this is an experiment. We tried different things to sort of see what would kind of unlock different, um, different experiences. Um, and then the third method we used was a writing exercise. And this was very simple. We asked people to write a letter to themselves in a year's time and to sort of tell themselves what were the things that they did, what were the things they found useful, what, what was helping them get through this time. And the sort of hope was that this would kind of put people into a, a reflective mood and sort of almost enable them to take a step out of themselves and to sort of look at their own experiences from the outside and kind of report back on them. Um, and, and doing so kind of really reflect on the things that um, they had found useful. So those were the three things that we had people do. And then in terms of what we kind of received back, um, as Grace and Miranda said, they were, they were very varied um, and kind of each of them sort of yielded um, really interesting kind of perspectives on things that people had found useful. Um, one thing that came up a lot was social connection. So a lot of people were relying on digital social connection and the importance of that to um, kind of stay positive and, and to kind of share their experiences with peers. Uh, but also people were often spending more time with people than they might've done with their immediate family, for instance. And this participant in the UK said that they really appreciated the time they spent with their mum over these, these weeks. And it had sort of strengthened their relationship in a way that they wouldn't have actually been able to otherwise. Uh, for those who were able to work from home during this time, that actually was a very key thing for them. Uh, so this participant in India said that um, they'd been in lockdown for three months and think they'd have driven themselves insane if they were just watching TV and lying on their bed. Um, so the importance of the, the meaning they gained from, from their employment was, um, was interesting. Positive activities. And we interpret this in a very sort of, you know, wide way. Um, this person here in Indonesia said that the best thing that happened to them during lockdown was when they got a Nintendo Switch. Um, and that kind of really changed things for them. Um, and then the nature and green spaces. So, um, you know, a lot of obviously people were kind of restricted in how they could access um, the outside in a lot of ways. But in a way, it kind of reminded them of the importance of those spaces. Um, and when they could access them, um, they, they kind of really benefited from them. Three other kind of areas I'll talk through quickly. Activism was one. So towards the end of this period, um, the Black Lives Matter movement was really sort of gaining momentum. And um, especially talking to participants in the US, um, we sort of gathered that they were gaining a lot of kind of meaning from partaking in this sort of um, activism in this movement, um, especially during the time of, of COVID. Um, arts and creativity. Um, so that's partly enjoying art and whether it's kind of watching TV as Miranda says, um, or actually kind of making art as well. And the kind of places that your mind goes when you're being creative. Um, and then finally, kind of education and learning. Um, obviously, a lot of students had to uh, change the way they were being educated and they were, um, their formal education was um, being changed in kind of enormous ways. But a lot of people were self-educating and learning things in a more informal way. Um, this person in Kenya talked about sort of learning to cook and reading and sort of saying that it wasn't just that they were bored, it was that they were kind of gaining purpose and having fun and, and learning from it as well. I think the most interesting thing in a way that came from all this was um, that we went into this project expecting that this to be a very difficult time for people. And of course it was. And a lot of these things that people were doing were things they were doing to, to cope. Uh, but also, I think a lot of our participants recognized this time as a, as a period that let them stop doing some of the things that they had felt caused anxiety in their sort of normal life. Um, and that actually, for those who had the kind of economic means to sort of just stop and kind of um, kind of recalibrate, they actually gained a lot of benefit from this time. Um, and a number of people that we spoke to 
said that actually the things that they had been doing to cope during COVID, whether it was, you know, art and creativity or exercise or um, learning or activism were actually things that they'd want to carry on and use kind of in their future lives and uh, take forward into normal life as well. It wasn't just for COVID. These are things that could help them kind of in the future. And that, that really actually has become the sort of grounding of the, the final part of this project, uh, which is a, a spoken word piece and um, a poem um, and a sort of short film um, that has uh, been uh, created by a, um, a filmmaker, uh, sorry, a, a poet and a theatre practitioner in South Africa um, called Kaleka Patuma. Um, unfortunately, um, Kaleka is not able to join us, but we're going we're gonna to share a reading from her of the, of the poem shortly. But I think this was a really interesting process for all of us. She essentially took the findings from this project. Uh, we shared video with her, we shared WhatsApp conversations. She really kind of immersed herself in the experiences that people had gone through during COVID and sort of combined those with her own experiences. And from that created a two minute uh, poem, really that kind of captured what this experience was like for, for people around the world. Um, we will now take this poem and we're actually going to create a short, an animated short film from this poem as well. So we're bringing in another creative voice, um, an animator who will then interpret it again and bring uh, another experience sort of to bear on the final product. Um, but I think now would be a great time to sort of play you all the video um, and to, to share um, the, the piece of a work, something new, which is a sort of summary of this, of this time. Hello. My name is Kolek Aputuma. I'm a poet and theatre practitioner based in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'll be sharing a poem I wrote and workshopped for a project called COVID Living. And the title of the poem is called Something New. In India, the same 5,000 word essay is read for the third time in Essex. Concentration is interrupted by mindless scrolling through social media. In Kenya, the circle rotates in the center of the screen until the online lesson is over. In Portugal, a little garden buries the weight of raw and relentless grief. In Tokyo, Berlin, Malawi, New recipes are kept as souvenirs until we can all gather and break bread again. In time, the 5,000 word essay will be read in between YouTube knitting tutorials. Social media scrolling will be traded for a 10,000 piece puzzle. Deep breaths will wait out unreliable internet. Spring will grow where grief was once planted. Something new will be the thing most Googled. Curiosity will nudge hands toward new experiments. People around you will also dive into things that will make them recognizable on most days and not so much on others. In time, corners of the map will hold ceremonies of new and old connections, unmuted mics and awkward virtual gatherings panic attacks that are given another name so that others can address you without needing to be excused or changing the subject. Beds stricken with loneliness and sickness. But there will also be ceremonies where the world will not feel as heavy as the night before, where mornings will start with dancing and prayers and stillness. Over time, the globe will have spun us all out of the familiar. We will not return the same. And this too will be okay. All the things we would have tried, discarded and gathered over this time are building a lifeline and compass for our future selves who will know how to hold and guide us should our worlds ever pause or spin into uncertainty again. So 
well, and why the full power needs we all here. This was a very great piece, and we all will send it in to our team. I'm sorry, the sound is coming through um, a little, not quite getting the sound from the uh, auditorium. Um, just about. We can't, I can't quite hear you, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry. We can, we can hear the start of the sentence, then just sort of fades out. Can you hear me? Yes. I was just asking you if you had any insights on your activity in this presentation today. Um, I, sorry, let me just hear. Did, did you say, did I have any slides on the active ingredients to share? Was that what you were asking? Yeah, I had. I, I shared them yesterday. I'm happy to share them again if that would be of interest to people. I've just got to find them. Um, uh, give me a second and I will see if I can. Uh, I, I haven't got a post uh, agreement to share. So maybe what would be good, maybe we should have a panel discussion and I'll look for them and I'll bring them up as part of the, if you give me permission to share, I'll look for them at the same time. Thank you. But I think it's worth saying that uh, what Tim shared there so powerfully in a way shows the power of cultural presentation of much more complex feelings than we can get just by sort of scientifically saying, here's active ingredient one or active ingredient two. If you look at the difference between the slides I'm about to share, which show sort of active ingredients as like store cupboard ingredients and the emotion that comes from listening to Kalika's poem, I think it's a really stark reminder of the power of art to help open up thinking in much more creative ways. I'd be interested, uh, Tim and um, Grace, if you agree, if that makes sense to you and how you felt the project uh, sort of brought those two, the science and arts worlds together. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think, I mean, it's interesting, um, you know, we identified the participants, uh, active ingredients the participants had sort of um, spoken about, but they of course didn't know about the active ingredients. It wasn't something they'd been briefed about or knew about. They just were just talking about their own lived experience and the things that they had done. Um, so really the, the sort of things we learned from them were coming from their, from what they did rather than from a sort of um, concept, I suppose. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in terms of kind of the value of the, the art and science coming together, I think, you know, the, the, uh, there is value in art being used to kind of disseminate stuff and to sort of find an audience for it. Um, and I think what Kaleka did in her poem and hopefully our final short film does is sort of find a new audience for this work and generate discussion. But actually in the process of making it, people engage with it as well. You know, it's been quite interesting talking through the animator, for instance, and sort of um, discussing how the animator will visualize some of the, the lines in, in the poem. For instance, actually, just one we were talking about yesterday, um, panic attacks that are given another name so that others can address you without needing to be excused or changing the subject. We actually had a long discussion about what that meant and what it meant to Kaleka and also what it meant to us and what it meant to our own experiences. So actually, by kind of creating something new, that's the name of the poem, but that's a pun, but like by creating something new, um, we were able to sort of engage with some of these topics as well. Yes, I mean, I think one of the interesting things for me is that mental health science is a complicated area where these concepts are very contested and, and there are lots of different opinions, not just between countries, but within countries, not just between, not just between scientists and non-scientists, but within scientists, within people with lived experience and with people with, not with lived experience. 
So I think that this, these sort of initiatives where we play with these ideas in new ways, so even what is a panic attack and what counts as depression and anxiety, we recognize, and I think welcome recognize, that these are complicated concepts. There's no magic way of, de- of boxing people into these concepts. Shall I just go quickly through some of these slides then? And then I might pass to Grace just to talk through from your experience, Grace, of how you feel this resonates, uh, particularly as you were one of the people that helped us select some of these that we end up funding. Um, So our sort of idea really is to try and think about what works for young people with anxiety and depression. Um, And uh, COVID, the the context of COVID, as, as Tim has said, in some ways, for some people, it was a release from normal life and may have actually felt less pressure and less anxiety. For others, it was a cause of anxiety and depression. But for everyone, we're trying to look at what works for them. And we've just funded uh, 30 different teams across the world to look at 26 different, what we've called active ingredients. Those are the things that really make a difference. The sort of things Tim was talking about came intuitively and naturally from the people that the COVID Living Project looked at and that scientists are also saying may be important. And we're using the metaphor of store cupboard ingredients, or indeed ingredients you might find at the chemist, to try and look at what helps, whether it's in a healthcare setting or a self-care setting. So for example, addressing loneliness may be an essential ingredient to address anxiety and depression, or it may be that if you address other ingredients, then loneliness will itself um, be affected. So one of the things we're interested in is which ingredients are the sort of core ingredients, like the core things in your store cupboard, and which ingredients are, that do you sprinkle onto other ingredients or will only work in the context of other ingredients. So we already know that the majority of young people, the majority of all of us, will experience anxiety and depression in some form by the time we're 38, and that, the, that, that uh, mental health Uh, and anxiety and depression are the most common mental health problems affecting over 400 million people worldwide. And that currently, the two main solutions offered are talking therapies or medications. And even with those, we don't really know how they work. Do talking therapies work in part because they address things like loneliness or allow people to feel more connected or more understood or feel like they matter? Do medications help because they reduce feelings of stress or do they help because they calm people down, which means you can have more social connections. These are all questions we need the science to discover. So we're interested in looking at active ingredients, whether they're in a healthcare setting or in a self-care setting or in the wider community, whether they're biological, behavioral or societal. And with many thanks to Tim and his team for mocking up these examples and for Grace advising us what were Rwandan um, brands that we hope we are not committing some terrible uh, contravention of, of using brands in any inappropriate way. But for example, you might have a staple food stuff, which is equivalent to trying to stop you getting into cycles of negative thinking that is telling yourself you're rubbish. You might find that using medication really helps in terms of thinking about, um, uh, you know, enabling you to get out of those loops. Or it may be that small positive activities, whether they are cooking or dancing or watching TV can help move you forward, particularly for depression. But there's also other interventions. So one of the teams we funded looked at giving cash transfers and found there was some evidence that actually giving people money actually may make a a, a significant difference to depression um, over time. Small differences, but consistent differences over a number of studies. So maybe very important to population level. And I guess one of the things we're really excited about at this festival is the way you're bringing these these ideas together with the sort of the dance, the creativity and the poetry that we've heard. Just to share with people that those videos and blogs from those Active Ingredients Research are available if they want to at this link. Questions from the audience that I have with me now, just now, I should say, and they are about what you just mentioned on uh, the youth and how they've been coping using uh, the, the active ingredients. And this question is from 
say the word where the findings of the different resources and coping mechanisms that the youth used during the pandemic and why did you focus the youth? When we find the elderly, most vulnerable population to COVID, and as you answer this, I also want you to touch on if you have any personal examples or experiences of collective resilience. And this question can be answered by either one of you or from Gatera Grace. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask that you repeat the question, please. Yes, that's okay. Uh, what were the findings of the different resources and coping mechanisms that youth used during the pandemic? And mm -hmm. why did you focus why did you focus on the youth when we find that the elderly are the most vulnerable population to COVID? And as you answer that, do you have any personal examples or experiences on collective resilience? Right. Um, I'm going to defer the the why focus on on older well, on younger people instead of older to Miranda. But I'll answer that uh, Tim and Miran and I have sort of shared what the findings were. Uh, sorry about the noise. Um, yeah, so the, the, there, were very, there were very many findings, but I think the biggest finding was that there's even, even like every, this is a cliche, but every, every dark cloud has a silver lining. People found that they had strength, even as they were going through some of the world's worst, uh, you know, crisis. Um, yeah, that's, that's the finding. And then a personal example of collective resilience that I find is my favorite is, um, is, is people stepping up to support each other. Mutual aid was one of my favorite. People showed up and they showed out. And I was so proud to see that, you know, people were like sharing books, sharing food, caring for the more vulnerable people in their communities. Um, my family uh, set up a, a Gatera Trust um, to, to, to just buy food on a monthly basis. Um, uh, for for some of our uh, uh, neighbors who, who are doing worse. Um, and and this was just an example of what countrywide people were doing. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. That was one of my favorite uh, personal examples of collective resilience. Uh, but I'll pass this to Miranda. Yes, as Miranda gets to. Yes, thank Let me also get to ask her on 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 another thing, uh, that as a connection to Mindscapes, the, the presentation that you were giving to us just now, the Project COVID Living is an extension of how poor uh, mental health is aligned to the effects of the pandemic and how can these projects influence uh, the youth to prepare for like the future crisis or anything that could come up just suddenly like this, how can these projects be influence the youth to prepare? So I think um, really helpful questions, thank you. So first to take the first question first of why we're focusing on youth rather than elderly populations. Yes. We, we, we recognize that the elderly are a very vulnerable population and of great interest in terms of mental health. Welcome made a decision. So we fund a research on the whole age range but the program I lead focuses particularly on youth because we recognize that 75% of mental health problems start before the age of 15. So we wanted to, to try and see if we could get in early to try and stop problems starting that would then affect the whole life course. We recognize there are a range of mental health problems that start later. It's just that we had to focus somewhere and this was where we wanted to focus. And I think we more generally have a belief that we want to focus on trying to help um, youth generally because youth mental health and particularly the adolescent period is quite an overlooked and underfunded area so that was the reason for that uh, in terms of how youth can prepare for future pandemics or future shocks and, and what our learning is i guess one of the key learnings was how much um individual difference there was in what people chose 
And I suppose that links with the research that says that mental health is a very individual experience and people may find what's right for them. What's right for one person may not be right for another. So in terms of how youth can prepare, I guess it's trying to learn what works for people in what context, trying that out. If it doesn't work, trying something else out. I think in terms of the wider issue of what the community can learn, I think the community has a lot to learn from youth. So as part of this program, we published our own position paper called uh, Enlarging Our Vision of Mental Health, which we collaborated on with the World Health Organization, UNICEF and the World Economic Forum, where we agreed three principles that we as big organizations were going to live by. One is to ensure that we learn and embed the experience of those with lived experience of mental health problems, particularly the youth. The second is that we learn from local innovations and local initiatives, such as where mutual aid is, is uh, developing. And the third is that we look larger than healthcare. We look at ways that societies can work together. And I think if we embed those three principles, working with young people as uh, agents of change, that may be the way for the future. Right. Uh, I have another question that is coming for Tim. Tim, are you here? Hi. Yeah. This question is, you're going to tell us why it is important to engage young people and co-create projects with them. And how did you come up with using this type of research? Why not use the usual interviews or surveys that we normally see and how you used research as the basis for the poem or animation and the collaboration between science and the arts and what every, uh, everyone gains from this. So basically it's about why did you choose this way of conducting research through the youth and how does it get, how do people gain from it? And the way it's, links everything in between science and arts and the COVID living season itself. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think what we really wanted to do was two things. One was to get a get sort of really kind of get into people's lives and get a sort of really nuanced sort of personal perspective on what they were doing. And so our kind of hypothesis was by allowing them to be creative, um, engaging them through, um, you know, text messaging and chat, by having them do something that they are finding useful, you sort of allow them to open up in a different way and to share their perspectives um, in a way that might yield, you know, interesting things and might sort of give you a different perspective than if you had sort of sent them a, a list of sort of questions just to, to answer. Um, and I guess part of the reason for doing that was because of the ultimate output of this project, which is the poem and short film. And that we knew that ultimately we would have to give an artist our findings and, and ask them to do something quite hard, which is to try and capture the experiences of not just 60 people that we engage with, but millions of people around the world uh, in a piece of poetry and, and animation. Um, and that the more kind of uh, sort of stuff we could give them, the more, more um, raw material, the more personal it was, the more distinct it was from one another, um, hopefully that would lead them to be able to create the sort of most um, sort of interesting final product. So that was kind of what led us down down that route. Yeah, I really like that. I really like the idea and how it came through for you. And I have one last question that comes, that just came in. And we saw a lot of collective actions done, like clapping for health workers or playing music together across balconies. Was this a consequence of the pandemic or was it in line with people always wanting to feel connected during a certain times? And this question can, anybody can answer it. I'm happy to start and others can come in. Please, yes. Um, I think that the thing about pandemics and times of crisis is they bring out the best and worst of human nature. And the best in us is that we want to connect and we want to support each other exactly as Grace said. And I think that's what we saw with the clapping and the coming together. I think we will come into more difficult times as this goes on and uh, some of the more difficult sides of our human natures as we face some of the more difficult long-term consequences will also come to the fore. 
Um, but I think we need to hold on. I think one of the things that heartened all of us from this project is holding on to all that fantastic human connection and ingenuity that will help us see us through. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in terms of that sort of social connection from the people that we spoke to, um, there was a real sense that, you know, people who were under lockdown had one main way that they would connect to people taken away from them, sort of namely face-to-face -face communication with people who weren't in their house. But that actually kind of meant that all the other ways that you could connect with people became more important. They sort of filled, filled that gap with different things. So whether that was, you know, if they have access to um, digital communication and um, getting in touch with people that they hadn't spoken to for a long time, um, sort of resorting to talking to people in their own house who they might not have really connected with that on that level that often, but with, you know, being stuck indoors with them for months on end, actually kind of forming new connections with them. And then sort of to the point of the, the questioner, um, kind of connecting with their neighborhood in whatever way they could and to the people around them. There seemed to be a kind of need to do this with whatever way they could, um, even if they weren't able to, to follow connection in, in certain ways. Sure. And how do you think the findings of this uh, COVID Living Project, how do you find it applicable and sustainable in the new normal? Do you find it as something we can keep doing and is it applicable for the next how many years? Is it, how is it applicable and sustainable? And this question goes to Grace. I, I still struggle with mute uh, 17 months later, sorry. Um, I, uh, I don't think I'm, I don't, I can't tell actually, uh, but I know that in order for the findings that Tim and uh, the rest of the teams, uh, the rest of the team uh, collecting this information um, gathered, I think in order to, to, to maintain their sustainability, I think there has to be some um, thinking together. I think there has to be unity across the mental health, but also, uh, you know, different sectors, you know, like art, like uh, academic institutions to, to, you know, to come up with ways in which they can implement them or in, introduce them into their regular way of living. So if, if and, and to find and, and to fund them and to find research, to fund research into it. Um, and I think Welcome is leading the way with active ingredients. Um, uh, they're looking into how to, you know, ways, what works for who. But I, I think this shouldn't only be on Welcome. It shouldn't only be on UGH. It shouldn't only be on one particular institution. It should be a mission for us all as people who live with mental health, who are interested in mental health, to find ways to be to for sustainable well-being. Um, but I'll pass this on as well to Tim or Miranda to, to sort of add on to what I've said. I can just jump in right there and on what you just mentioned and Miranda can answer that as well. Do you think that young people are really aware of their mental health status, especially during the COVID-19 and how, what other different ways have they been through the research that you've been conducting? What are the different ways that they using besides arts? Because I understand that some people are not artistically fluent and may just be doing things because it's pastime. But how, what are the different ways can they deal with anxiety and depression? And do you really think that they are aware of their mental health status, especially during this COVID-19? I don't know, Grace, whether you want to have a first answer and then I'll come in. Sorry? I, I, I could you, what's, what's the question, sorry? I was just asking her if I was just jumping in to ask her something else. And I was asking, does she think that young people are really aware of their mental health status, especially during this COVID-19 and besides the artistic way of 
of showing it or even dealing with it or even the way we are spending time indoors? What are the different ways have they been showing you that they are dealing with anxiety or depression, especially during this season, this COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic? Yes. Yeah, Marina, I can jump in for a little bit. I can say that, yes, young people are aware of their mental health. I think I'd even uh, suggest that young people, are, young people now are more aware of their mental health than when the older people now were young. Um, I think because perhaps the resources that exist and the work that has been done from down to up to, uh, to, 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 to educate people on mental health, I think young people are aware. And aside from the things that we are talking about now, I think a great way that young people have been caring for their mental health is by seeking online resources. Um, I can give an example of Mentally Aware Nigeria, which is run by uh, uh, a good friend of ours, Victor Ugo. Uh, they, they, during the, the pandemic, they, they ran out of uh, volunteers because of the level of support that young people were seeking from them. Um, and, and they have close to 50,000 uh, volunteers across Nigeria. So I'd say that young people in, are, are more thirsty actually for resources as opposed to unaware of mental health. And I think it's up to us to, to figure out how to provide it for them. Uh, back to you, Miranda. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. We're running out of time. And thank you so much for participating in this. And you have done a great job to go through what people are really going through, especially the youth. And aligning it with art is a very innovative and very creative idea. And um, to my audience, thank you so much for following this discussion. It was with team Miranda and Grace from the fine object and COVID living. And I cannot wait to see more work from you. Please do share or even seek the resources on the UGHC website. So just keep enjoying the festival. We are still together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you, Sharon. And sorry, we have a little bit of an echo. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, we had great conversation this afternoon, and uh, we have a few reflections to make before we transition into our next conversation. So uh, for the women uh, in mental health um, panel discussion, we had so many insights. I'm going to be summarizing a few of them. Uh, these are great times to be a woman. Yet, women are across the globe are still facing different issues. We talked about gender-based violence. We talked about social pressure. And we also talked about that sometimes there is a, a social cost to professional women. And all of this can lead to mental health issues. We explored the theme of gender-based violence that affect women. And that can lead to depression, anxiety, and sometimes suicide. Women can do more uh, than just childbearing. We heard a provocative conversation on that. You know, we have proven that we can be more uh, to this. And also we had a conversation connecting the dots between body image, mental health, as well as uh, how that puts some pressure on the expectation that the society has on women. Um, Zuba uh, said a very powerful sentence that words carry a lot of power. So the words that we tell women uh, through different like, uh, uh, interactions uh, and uh, 
professional engagement do have also an effect on their mental health. So it's very important that we keep engaging positively uh, with women to, uh, to be able to ensure that like, there is a, a higher level of uh, mental sanity. Uh, this one actually breaks my heart every time when I hear it, uh, that the vast majority of the poorest population on earth are women. Uh, another component also that definitely affects women, uh, mental health, is sexual harassment. And according to the UN uh, Women Report, we are three in four women who experience sexual harassment or assault in workplaces throughout our careers versus one in four men. So we need men to continue to advocate for these issues, but also to make a change. And we've seen so many great men uh, supporting and championing uh, the creation of uh, more spaces, safer spaces for women to be and thrive. So it's about time that we continue these efforts and we also salute those men who have been very supportive. And also it's great uh, to hear that women across the globe are increasingly using arts to heal. And my challenge to all of us is how do we keep closing the gender gap? Uh, we've done so much, let's continue, but much more intentionally. So this is Hamwe Festival. We are creating a neighboring environment between health sectors and creative industries. So keep reaching out to us uh, through our social media and uh, the uh, past convention that we just had about COVID living uh, just, just took us to uh, the beginning of this year when in January, in February, even early March, we had a totally different lifestyle. We didn't know that COVID would be happening. It started as a health outbreak in China and it became a global pandemic. And here we are uh, with uh, uh, health losses. We have lost almost uh, actually over 1 million lives due to the pandemic. And it's now hard even for me and so many of you to watch a movie without feeling that urge of reminding actors to wear masks. So COVID has happened, it is now shaping our living and our conversation, that's the need for us to really like a talk about how the COVID pandemic had a global impact and, what, uh, and how the preventive measures had actually sometimes negative consequences on mental health. Um, so this conversation also uh, took us through uh, an understanding of how young people are much more aware of mental health issues and hopefully they're accessing uh, many services uh, that can support them uh, through these struggles. And uh, one of the key reminders from our panelists was to write a letter to ourselves. You know, sometimes we go through struggles, sometimes we uh, forget that we do matter, but also sometimes it's an invitation to pause and reflect. So for the remaining of the evening here in Kigali, we are going to be having other engaging sessions. So the next, the next one is going to be around the di digital exhibition, uh, exploring themes of uh, stigma, power, and hopes. We're going to be having conversation around Amazon's project. You have a very nice exhibition uh, awaiting us, so please stay tuned. And we're also going to have our final conversation around resonant spaces. How can we find well-being through parks and music? So without any other further uh, ado, I'm going to be uh, inviting uh, Indronge Karanga, who will be our moderator and who will also be introducing our next session, which is the digital um, exhibition. Thank you so much. Our work started as we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors and we are also exploring the role of culture uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, is that everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. Nagani riye nava hanzi tuare kumwe, ariko kumva kwa hara hanzi wa shobara kuinji la mwini sekita ya achu, kandi mwurja wutegu yeneza, tukumbi shabidu shemeshije, ya baru kuandika, ya baru gushanya, buri ya ibibazo byo mu mutwe nabyo ubuhanzi bushobora kongera kugira ngo umuntu asubire mu buzima busanzwe. My hope is the festival will um, foster understanding, collaboration uh, between the different uh, healthcare sectors, and the different artists. Good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for being part of uh, Hamoy Festival. Thank you for the people we saw from our uh, very early audience data that people are joining from different countries. So thank you for that. Thank you also for engaging on Twitter. 
We're very, very happy to receive your question. We created a hashtag for that, that is hashtag Ask Hamwe. And if you uh, tweet, we're going to make sure to make you part of this session. I really want to remind that Hamwe is a public engagement uh, project. So we really uh, are looking forward to discuss with you, to have you participate to the different sessions that we do. My name is Injonge Karangwa. I'm uh, the chief organizer for Hamwe Festival. So my role with uh, the many, many people that uh, are not on stage, but uh, are sometimes behind the camera or with a, a time sign uh, is to prepare this uh, program for you to um, show how arts can have a tremendous contribution in health and health sectors. And uh, as you know already, this year, the theme is mental health and social justice. So as it was very well discussed in the different panels that were preceding this moment today, we uh, know that uh, mental health is a, an individual experience, a societal experience. We know that mental health, uh, mental illnesses and disorder affect our communities in many, many ways uh, that one in three human beings would at some point of their life have a mental health problem. So it's uh, people, it's us, it's people that we know. Uh, so it's a societal problem in our society. For example, it's in Rwanda, here in Rwanda, but definitely in so many places. We had people from India, we had people from Hong Kong, we had people from the UK showing how the youth were coping with this uh, crisis, this pandemic that we're facing right now where people are isolated. So from all of that, uh, while we are, we're preparing these uh, many, many discussions, we saw that many, that few th themes were emerging. Um, and through this conversation, we thought about stigma. Stigma because it's, uh, mental health is a individual experience, but definitely also how I see the word and my relationship with the word would affect my mental health. Stigma is um, affecting people in reaching service, having a healthy social uh, existence, having a healthy relationship. So we often call it a double burden on the people that are already affected by mental illness. Power, definitely when we talk about social justice, it's impossible not to talk about power. Just earlier, um, Giramata, Zuba, Dr. Tion, they talked about gender. There are so many, uh, so many, so many um, uh, social determinants. And when you break it down, you see that behind a social determinant, there is a, a source of power that maybe is impairing people to have live their full potential and be in a state of mental health. And then there is hope, because that's one of the things that we want to bring with this conversation about Hamwe, where we try to be positive and solution-oriented, uh, is hope. We believe that hope is individual, but when it's shared across communities or globally, like we're trying to do with this platform, it can create change, uh, it can create new energies, it can create new ideas. And so that's how this project was built, Stigma, Power and Hope. So in this project, we joined scientific community and artists uh, to create um, ideas together. I will not tell you more. We will first discuss that through a video with one of the artists that was part of this project. Her name is Krista Wasse. She's a visual artist from Rwanda. Just have a look. It's pretty amazing. As an artist, there's always this thing of rejection. Like you, you treated like an outcast. The whole accepting and taking this journey and believing that I'm an artist is also power. So listening to these stories um, they really touched me and I felt different. It gave me more strength. Uh, art, science, religion, niki, nukimu, kuko, chose kiva, mutwe. Kujango vitanu can be terganava, chobumba, shagumbaraga, you gumba gukora, you gumba kujana, 
kuko iyo bitandukanyije ka kamaro cyaje gifita ari kimwe gahita gasa nkaho kajya mu duce twinshi fite umuti mfite igikoresho mfite inzira yafasha um, kuba ka societe yacu kurwanya kato uh, kujijura abantu bese no guha abantu buzima bushya wenda nk'abantu baba baragize umwana ho kwihera cyane muri cyo gihe kubera ko bo ntabwo hari giye bakenera umuntu ubereka inzira ntekereza ko muri yo case ati akora do it was a 3 day workshop there was a lot of information the interesting part was the um, transferring uh, trauma like from mother to child i found it very interesting but um I'm thinking of exploring that. Uh, artistically, um, I'll do it like using the collage technique that involves pasting bits of paper. I'm thinking of crochet, doing lots of thread work because those are my um, mediums. I feel I'll express it through my usual technique. I like to work in a quiet space and without people asking me where are you how's the progress um uh, how far have you reached and uh, what are you thinking because when it comes to the thought process there are lots of changes like you move from one idea to another and then you end up being lost in all that stigma power and hopes so the first work here is about stigma i think if you look at it you'd see um uh, a face that's different from what we were accustomed to or what we know um what we are used to uh so it's about the way people see um people with mental health issues or have challenges or even people are trying to recover or heal uh even people with trauma eh yakabiri eh ni kuri power imbaraga ah is imbaraga navuga ko ziri collective harimo guhura abantu bagasangira ibitekerezo cyangwa se bakavuga ku bibazo byabo ariko nanone harimo individual power ingi rero iri abstract the abstract ivuga kuri uh, hope hope akenshi ni kintu kitagaragara kwa kibona mu bikorwa ariko kenshi gihera mu imbere so kuri nge umuntu ushatse kurewi i tableau na mubwira ko agomba gushakisha muri kuko it's about a feeling so uh, if you'd compare this work to this one this is a bit cold and uh kwera kala zayo but then the other one is it gives light so i think it's about people searching within themselves for that uh hope na handi aturuka ntabwo wagenda ngo yitoragura ahantu iki kize ntabwo wagitoragura nyine gituruka muri wowe so nicyo bivuze there's a time i went to Bugesera, and this man was talking about his experiences that he would hear things in his ears like he was a soldier so he'd hear so many sounds so he didn't have a word for that and i too couldn't get it but maybe a doctor could but what is it in kinyarwanda i've been like reading about these words like really trying to differentiate them for example anxiety worry depression or being depressed because they have the same uh thing in them like the uh, aspect experiences or um situations but then they are also different so um i was there thinking like uh okay i get them but what are they in kinyarwanda because we need them in our own language to be able to talk about mental health to be able to explain to people 
what these uh, things we feel or experience are. So what I like is um, the doctors being there, the experts, artists, and then we, we, we're all talking about the same thing and then sharing experiences, learning. Uh, so it was good for me. Uh, um, because I know most times, most times, artists are just given a theme and then sometimes they don't know anything. So they're just going to create based on feelings or, okay, what they know. But again, we need to know the, the theory. We need to know the words. We need to know what research has been done. Uh, we need to interact with the people who are directly in the field. Hello, we're back. So you see that I'm not alone anymore. With me, there is Krista. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for being part of Hamu Festival. Thank you for including me. So we've seen this great video introducing you and introducing this, this work. But before we get to the project and what we've done in the operation of this festival, I wanted to talk a bit about you. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? I think it's always better if it's in your words. Um, I'm Krista Wasse. I'm a collage artist. Um, I started doing collage in 2013. And I haven't stopped. Okay. And what are the topics generally that you explore in uh, your arts, your collage? Uh, I usually focus on women um, because I feel we women have a lot to talk about. We have so many things that we see, but sometimes keep to ourselves. So I feel um, if I use my talent and my art, I'm going to expose all these things. Though sometimes they don't come out in the work, but they're always there. That's great. And I, I can tell you that one of the, the reason we started this partnership when we were like, which artists we're gonna work with one of the reasons why we were very impressed and interested in collaborating with you was the fact that uh, there's some uh, elements of activism, I think, in, in your work. Do you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree because I'm interested in change. I want to see change. Uh, I want to see different people like we, I'm, I'm tired of these old versions that keep coming and I feel people can change if they really want to. People can be better if they want to. Yes, the hope. <laughs> so um, I think that now we can talk a bit about the project. Yeah. So this project, I'll give a few words about it. A few months ago, we started collaborating with a group of random artists with the goal to build a bridge between recent research about mental health in Rwanda and people that actually use their art as activism and that seem to be very interested by the current situation uh, and the mental health crisis and participating in the dialogue that is necessary at our national level in mental health. And how we organized, we looked at the different barriers that are preventing people from reaching treatment, the different factors that are making people not in a state of mental health, and also different aspects, for example, transgenerational trauma, the role of language, uh, the role of culture that are not necessarily always taken in account when we speak about mental health, when there is very often a clinical approach when it should be a holistic approach. And so we engage in that discussion. We built what we like to call a health, uh, a science, art science project. And there was a conversation between this group of artists and this group of uh, scientists. And after, let's I'll stop that. We'll talk the rest about the rest after. 
So my first question to you, Christophe, would be, how was the experience? What do you have to say about it? What did you learn? How, what did you find about this exchange? Um, it was really good because, okay, there's, there's COVID-19 and the residence was somehow different from what we're usually used to because um, whenever we have a, a, a residency, we come together, work together. So this time we were in a space where you'd be seated far away from your fellow artists, um, which is good. It happens to us, like you have your own space to yourself. Um, but then another thing is trying to think about how you talk about your work or how your work will be seen because that's worrying. Um, but then there was constant communication, like you'd call your fellow artists, like, how far are you? How is it going? Um, what are you going to show? Because when we work together, for example, in like uh, the workshop we had, we're always together, we're always talking about how we feel, what we think, how we're going to create. But this time it was totally different. Um, it's not bad, it's not bad and it's not discouraging, but um, I think it's empowering. It prepares us for more changes in the future. Um, like then which another one? thing, sorry? More changes, like, like which one? For example, we, no one expected this to happen. No one expected the coronavirus to spread all over the world. So it's also change, but a negative one. So as humans, we should be prepared for such changes. Um, another interesting thing is uh, talking with the experts, the different doctors, uh, also having people who go through the very problems we're talking about. We're talking about mental health issues, uh, we're talking about mental illnesses. So it, I'd say it's, uh, it was a totally unique and special experience because often as artists, like you're given a theme, you go in your own space, your studio or the gallery you work from and then think or just create. But this time, there were people, different people, talking about how mental health is, what it is. So we were given this um, information that we, re we rarely don't get because we don't um, interact with um, people who, are, who have the, inf the information, people who have the knowledge. Um, so we are always working on our own. That too is not bad, but then sometimes we need to work with the very people who are working directly with other people or, or who are working directly with these issues. So it's important for the artist. Uh, for me, I feel getting like learning all these words uh, that I, that I had in the workshop, like I had to go back and do the research, go through uh, different, um, different books people have written, like not all the books of reading the whole book, but then going through. Um, then also I kept asking myself like, okay, we, we are speaking in English, but what about our own language? What about uh, developing all these terms, terminology, like how do we talk, talk about mental health in Rwanda? How do we educate people? How do we create awareness? Because we don't have the words to describe, to define situations or experiences or events that happen to people. So 
for me, uh, I'm still interested in how we're going to develop the language. Like, how are we going to talk about mental health? Not this general thing like, ah, okay, most times we describe everything as ibisazi. May I ask you to translate with our, the ibisazi means craziness? Mad, craziness madness, or yeah. madness, mm -hmm. yeah. For international audience. But then we should not include, exclude the Rwandans, you know? That's why it's a translation. Yeah. Feel free to speak in the language where that suits your purpose, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I feel we really need to work hard as Rwandans, um, have a, a dictionary for all these terms that we need. Uh, so that we could see the change that we want, yeah. It's great that you talk about that. We actually have a, a session about it on um, the 14th, which is Saturday, where um, uh, there's a group of uh, Rwandan doctors, Dr. Shas, no, no, Shas, which is a, an applying PhD, and Dr. Utembesa, that I actually, they were, they, they, the story is really interesting. They say that, how they were at the forefront of creating a uh, mental health system before we had what we still need to develop, but what is already there, and had meetings where, where they were having debates about how we're going to translate the word depression, how we're going to translate the word trauma. So it's uh, a very, uh, it's, I think it's a conversation there is like, you know, when there is innovation, there's some fire at different places. Of the of the world, and I think that's definitely something that is happening here. And uh, yeah, I, I would really invite you and you to 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 join that because um, what you're saying is really really true. I think um, mental health is definitely an individual experience linked to what how you understand the world, how you how you how you understand Same who you feeling. are yeah, how you feel it yes. and uh, being able to explain to yourself and to others that's uh, definitely something that is uh, extremely important um, and I'm glad you're bringing uh, that point did you brought a bit of that in the creations that you made Sorry? in the artwork that you made did you was this ID one of the driver of your creative energy i if we talk about language i think art is a language already like it's a language it's a visual language uh it's also based on feelings so i think in this piece here do you want to have to look let's go closer yeah. do you want to should we start by hope yes uh, this is hope yeah <laughs> so hope is something individual but then it can also be shared and it, it can become collective. Um, so I think if someone looks at this, they have to look inside, they have to look within, they have to look in their own souls, their minds, their hearts to see what's there. Yeah. Okay. So it's an encouragement to the viewer? To yes, look. yes, always, always. It should always be the individual first whenever we're talking about mental health uh, because we need to understand the other person and we need to give them space. So uh, I feel um, if we give someone space, then we're likely to understand what they're going through, what they feel, what they think. Um, and and the, the problem is Stigma is a result of not understanding the other person's world because we don't let them um, tell us what they feel, tell us what they're going through. Instead, we stereotype them, we discriminate them. So that's, that's what happens when you don't let people be themselves or allow them to express what they're going through. So for me, this work is about letting people see who they are, feel what they're feeling, or think what they want to think, yeah, but in a positive way, yeah. 
yeah, not, not in, of course they could be feeling something negative, but I, I feel this work should give them hope. And do you want to talk to us a bit about, because I have a lot of admiration for that, your technique, how these pieces are built? We saw some images, if you can recall in the video. Please tell us more. About the work? About your technique, your collage the, technique. Okay. Um, collage is a technique. Okay. It's a technique with different ways. Uh, for me, I chose paper. I'm comfortable with paper. I'm not comfortable with paint. Yes, you could do a collage and add paint, but if you, look in, if you look at my work, I use little paint, not a lot of it. So collage is, um, for me, it's pasting bits of paper on canvas. Um, also, um, I could add something different, like fabric, but not really. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like fabric. It doesn't consume the glue well, but for paper, it's perfect. Yeah. And it looks amazing. Should we talk about the two other pieces that yes. you amazingly did for us? So which one next? I will let you choose. <laughs> power. <laughs> so this is about power. Mm -hmm. Where is the power here? Who is powerful? Uh, the power here is in people coming together to solve the issues, the mental health issues. It's the power lies in awareness, coming together, uh, working together. You can, as you could see here, there's someone who's trying to educate, I'd call it that, or raise awareness or help people understand what mental health is. So that's power. So it's collective power. But always is, it starts with the individual because uh, when, you, when you decide to attend something or to be part of something, then it starts from you. It starts with you. So there's the individual power and then there's the collective power. Does it, uh, it reminds me of some of the, the scenes of a health information and health information campaign that, uh, that I've attended. Does it, is it inspired from something like that? <laughs> Did you witness something of this sort like, like me? Yes, yes, uh, I have. Because if you look at the setting or the way the people are seated here, this is, this is how things are done in Rwanda. Yeah. It's not like inside here, the usual conferences, but then there's the ordinary way Rwandans um, solving their problems. There's Atumurenge, the sector uh, offices. So people sit under the trees, which I think is really good because they're in a natural environment and it has a great effect on their mental health. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Um, uh, often, like, it's the people living together. Like, it's, it's more about community. Yeah. yeah. So I like such um, gatherings. Yeah, gatherings compared to the, the ones inside here because they don't give access. Sometimes they exclude people. For example, if you, if you have a discussion about mental health, in a big hotel, who's going to come? And most times it's people with, um, I know people are going to come, but then if we look at class or how people are living or what they think about the space, most people aren't going to come. And most people um, who don't have access to, I'd say good things. Um, what would you recommend? I think we should, the environment should be inclusive. Okay. Yeah. We should um, try to 
I'd say discourage these spaces. Like for example, you, we, you, you're talking about mental health, but then you're not having poor people here because poverty is a big problem and it affects people mentally. So you're talking about women's rights. Some women can't get here because they can't afford um, maybe coming to such a big hotel. So sometimes the, the spaces we hold these conversations in are likely to affect how people who live with different problems, um, like they feel that they are excluded. That, that's what I think. So for an environment like this one, I think it's welcoming, it's, it's open, that's one thing. It doesn't have closed walls, uh, there are no walls. Um, another thing is you have so much to see, <laughs> like looking around, looking at trees, thinking, is the air, we are not having this artificial air. So lots of things. Okay. I would say that uh, our intent with Hamoy Festival is definitely to have the, the research, the results of research that are very often uh, kept in the academic world, uh, reach many people and as many people uh, as we can. I think that uh, we're being inclusive by getting out of the university. And uh, I really hope that actually what is discussed would be taken beyond, beyond, beyond but we are believing and uh, we'll continue to uh, do our part. Should we talk about the next? Yeah. So this one is about stigma. It's about how we humans see each other, like the way we define or describe um, illnesses, situations or experiences, but it's about discrimination, stigma. It's about stereotypes. Um, so it shows like a woman with an um, animal-like face, because often people with mental health issues are treated in a totally different way. If, if we are to compare people with physical disabilities, by the way, people feel pity for them, but then when it comes to people with um, mental health issues, people tend to move away because they do, one thing is they don't understand. Another thing is all these things they hear, for example, the person has been bewitched, so they have some demons, they are possessed with something evil. So it's about how people see uh, any person with, uh, a mental health problem, yeah. Okay, should we sit back, continue our conversation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'd like to ask you a bit about what uh, your general, um, the general outcome for you of this, uh, this effort. So I'll get back to our intent. There's uh, this scientific community that uh, has this research on what works, what is uh, the necessary for improving mental health, uh, uh, that has also some gathered some information about uh, the barrier for people to, to access services or to, to express freely the different uh, stigma of uh, the, the different uh, uh, barrier to, for them to feel better, and for the stigma was one of them, which we studied. And I would like to ask you, um, based on, on, on this, and uh, this is uh, one of the, of uh, those are three, uh, one of, of our pieces that we're going to, to show, to, to continue this discussion, to show in different places, including big hotels. And I want to, to uh, ask you how, uh, what are the outcomes for you and what do you think this conversation could continue in this place, in other places? In, uh, how do you think that we can continue this, this mission that we gave ourselves? Um, the first thing we should do is 
move such conversations from places like this. And do you want to, because that's the intent, right? Yes, we, we need give... to, for example, um, we are here, we are using, we are using like this sophisticated technology. Yes, it's important, but then there are people who don't have this technology. No, we know that, but what I'm trying to ask you, because where I'm trying to get is like, uh, how um, by providing this information to artists, how does it move forward? Um, how do we move forward? Um, I, I don't know, and I also know. I don't know because if we're talking about artists, which artists are we talking about? We could talk about you. Me, I sometimes, I, I have to be honest, sometimes when we engage or we involve ourselves in work that requires change, it can be exhausting. And sometimes you want to move away. Sometimes you want to be in your own world, doing your own things, and you just want to forget the world. So on the other side that I know is, um, I think as an artist, um, I would use like my art to, to help people understand mental health issues, to understand mental health in general or something specific about it. Um, we could introduce art therapy and, and that needs to also be in our language, like what's art therapy? I'm sure if I would, I, if I would uh, talk about it in Kinyarwanda, it would be kuvura It's It's also a long word, but sometimes we need short words to make it easier for people to understand or grasp. So I feel in dealing with all these different issues that we have, art is still important. We need to include art in, in how we treat mental health. For example, in, in Rwanda, we don't have that yet. Or even if, or maybe if it's there, I think it's still at um, a small scale. Um, I also think we need to train more people to use art. We, we also need to be educated, like how do we use art to, to help people? I remember someone talked about if we use art, doesn't it like uh, bring up, doesn't oh, it bring up yeah, people in a negative way? So I feel I'm not there yet as an artist. I don't, maybe I know how it could bring out something negative. For example, when I look at the work that I made about stigma, I think about people who have phobia. I could trigger something. So, um, I feel as an artist, uh, I need to learn more. I need, I need to also be educated, like to learn all these proper ways to use the art, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I really enjoy talking here, but unfortunately our time is over. Uh, and I, I definitely, uh, at least we'll take each other our takeaway, but my takeaway is uh, us as universities and as scientists, as researchers, we definitely need to reach out further and uh, take the hand to the artist. And uh, thank you for reminding that uh, mental health is not uh, something that you discuss without the patients. We heard that during the workshop with uh, uh, Claver from Opromamer and uh, uh, mental health is uh, the health of individuals, individuals all over the world, individuals that uh, 
face different realities and uh, uh, it's our responsibility to go and reach out to them. So thank you for reminding that to us. And uh, we'll continue, as you say, as artists, there's definitely a demand to reach, uh, uh, to, to get more information, see if I hear you and maybe the other three that uh, we'll talk uh, about, we'll talk with um, later. So thank you. Thank you for being part of this, uh, this, this off-site residency in time of COVID. Is there a last word, anything that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, um, I feel this is the time, like, okay, it has always been the time, but this time we really need to take mental health seriously because often we focus on physical health, eating healthily, bodybuilding, exercising, but then we don't talk about mental health. So we need, uh, for example, in the gyms, uh, we also need like a part where we'll, the works on the mental health, like how do we improve how we live, uh, how do we improve mental health. We should talk about it in schools, for example, teachers, they need to talk about this because they are also, I have to say this, if it offends people, they should get offended. Teachers also contribute so, so much to poor mental health. For example, nagging, stereotypes. For example, girls, girls in schools, like you're told, oh, you're stupid, you don't know mathematics. Girls will never understand mathematics. So I think teachers need to do better. And then we have journalists who, um, who should make an effort of unlearning all these negative things that contribute to poor, to poor mental health. Um, and then the other people are, are, are doctors. Like for example, this is common and it's normalized. As if you're not human, like they ask you these questions, um, like it's like saying you two you're sick, like it's a surprise. So it's as if you are not a human. So I feel we need to change how we talk to people. We need to improve um, also our thinking. I would say I'll, I'll call it that. We change how we think. We change how we treat people, um, and it should be everywhere, everywhere. For example. Um, I also talk about this situation we're in. I've seen so many people with mental health issues, especially these serious illnesses, who have been, um, I'd say, neglected. No one tells them to wash their hands. No one offers them masks. They are humans too. They need to survive this virus. So, I feel the mental health sector needs to put an effort in that. They need to talk, they need to, talk to the volunteers, uh, the people there who are telling us to wash our hands, to use sanitizers. They should include people who are calling ourselves mad people. They need to think about them. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely the big message is, um, I have to summarize, inclusiveness across class, across beyond disease and beyond uh, uh, what are perceived differences. Um, I hope we're going to continue these conversations in other settings. Uh, what we can tell you is that uh, as a university, uh, Global Health Equity, uh, we bring this conversation in our community engagement. And um, yes, it was really a pleasure to uh, go through these uh, few weeks of uh, residency with you. I think the result is beautiful. And thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you.
started as we were exploring uh, how creative industries uh, could uh, collaborate with health sectors and we we're also exploring the role of culture uh, in health. When we talk about mental health, these are everyday experiences. The work that we are doing on mental health, everyone should be involved. Naganiriye nabahanzi twari kumwe ariko kumva ko hari abahanzi bashobora kwinjira muri sector yacu kandi mu buryo buteguye neza twumbishe bidushimishije yaba ari ukwandika yaba ari gushanya buriya ibibazo byo mu mutwe nabyo ubuhanzi bishobora kongera kugira ngo umuntu asubire mu buzima busa My hope is the festival will um, foster understanding collaboration um, between the different uh, healthcare sectors the different artists Okay, welcome back. Um, we're going to be having uh, a conversation with uh, Christelle Alas, who is going to be discussing uh, the um, uh, Amazon, Amazon uh, project that she has done with uh, women in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, trying to fight uh, the issue of uh, drug use and abuse. And uh, she's going to be explaining a little bit more about how the journey was and what was the experience working with the women. We're also going to be having some of uh, the artwork that uh, were part of the project uh, displayed here tonight. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, introduce yourself. Also, like uh, the artwork that you're going to be discussing as part of this next conversation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Christelle Arras. I'm a French photographer. And uh, I live now in Kigali uh, since 2019. But before that, I was living in Abidjan, in Ivory Coast, for two years and a half. And there, um, so I, I did a project with uh, Médecin du Monde, Doctor of the World. Um, they were looking for someone to uh, give um, a well, um, a well-being uh, session for you women that were following uh, women using drugs mm. and uh, so I propose a photographic project to do portraits of this woman um, and so we decided to organize a, a photo session in a professional studio and with makeup and uh, clothes, um, a long um, length uh, clothes from a stylist. And um, so this was the main idea of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, and the result was beyond our expectation. And uh, so Médecin du Monde decided to uh, do an exhibition with these pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, um, and we, we uh, made this project uh, between April and December. And uh, when we did this uh, selection for the exhibition, we asked the woman to write some words about what they felt about these pictures. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what they said was uh, quite uh, emotional for me, because I realized that I'd uh, put a finger in something really uh, important. Uh, because we had fun when we did this studio session uh, and it was very joyful and uh, it was really nice. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we read this, uh, these words, uh, what came out was that uh, these pictures uh, gave this woman uh, back self-esteem mm -hmm. of themselves. Mm -hmm. And most important, it gave them uh, the hope mm -hmm. that maybe they could stop using drugs mm -hmm. and eventually go back to a normal life. Mm -hmm. So, and for some of them also, um, 
it was difficult because they realized that uh, maybe the, uh, yeah, the, 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 they went in a, in a path where they maybe ruined their life. Mm. And uh, so it was a little bit uh, weird because I thought maybe I did wrong because uh, I put uh, also a finger in a sensitive mm -hmm. uh, thing for, for the mental <laughs> health. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but it was mostly positive. So um, we did the exhibition. These pictures were also uh, used for conference uh, organized by Inès saint mm -hmm. And uh, after I wanted to continue this work with them, so I explored a bit more um, the, the, their portrait mm -hmm. in their environment also, uh, where they lived. And when uh, we did that, uh, there was an evolution in the way they acted in front of my camera. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting because after this studio tape session, uh, they get, they got much more confidence in themselves and their ability of being beautiful again. Mm -hmm. mm. I show them that they could be beautiful, mm. actually, and they, they could be beautiful women. Mm. Uh, these women are really, uh, they are damaged by life. Mm. Um, it's not only drugs, it's also the social context and context. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as women in this, uh, in this, um, this environment of using drugs is very uh, violent for the for the women. Mm -hmm. um, they are confronted confronted to a lot of violence mm -hmm. and abuses. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 uh, hard <laughs> actually. Um, so the idea was not to show this part of their life, but to show a positive image of them. And, uh, and after, yeah, that's, that's a bit the process of uh, all this project. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that some of them have, have stopped using drugs after this project. Mm -hmm. And others were thinking about it, mm -hmm. maybe more accurately. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my idea at the beginning was not to save any, anyone, it was just to uh, make people and move this woman feel good mm -hmm. and uh, feel beautiful again. And, um, and I think what was important is to uh, give them this hope mm -hmm. and uh, um, yeah, to, to feel better and mm -hmm. to recover a bit of femininity also. Mm -hmm. because they have to fight, you know, it, uh, they have to struggle every day in the middle of men and this environment. So uh, to, to forget all this, even if it was a very short time, mm -hmm. because each time we had a, say a photo session, mm -hmm. it was very short because it's a public that cannot focus for a long time. True. Uh, so, sometimes it was just 30 minutes. Mm. Uh, the studio, it took only uh, one hour and a half for uh, this woman to uh, be a photograph. So it was very, very, very short. I was, uh, at, it was the first time I was really working in a studio and I had the feeling of, I was in a battlefield, you know, in a, in a war field, because it was very quick, you had to, uh, shoot very quickly because the attention was not uh, there all the time. So uh, it was a very interesting uh, project, and I, uh, yeah, and I, I'm proud that uh, it could be shown in other places and maybe also um, show another image also of uh, drug users because they are very stigmatized, and uh, we tried to. Uh, to give portrait that was not um, yeah, a judgment or anything uh, and uh, to show something else. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um,
So this whole exhibition is going to be shown, uh, I think if you go on our social media, you will see that the link is published uh, and you can go online and visit our digital gallery. So please uh, well, well, welcome, go see. I think one of the reasons why we were very interested uh, by discussing this project with you is this substance abuse mm -hmm. uh, uh, is considered as a mental illness. Um, and there uh, I go with each personal opinion. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, our relationship with this type of disease is a blame on the user when actually a person needs treatment. And so I think that's why I recommend you for, for this work. And I'm glad that it's part of Hamui Festival mm -hmm. because substance abuse is a mental illness, should be treated as such. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a mind shift uh, change that is, uh, that is uh, necessary. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Njonge. And for me, I was positively surprised to see that, you know, when you talk about substance abuse, drug abuse, we don't necessarily think about uh, uh, women, and we even less think about African women. And it's really like a great to see that you're putting a highlight on that because it's a population that is underrepresented when we're considering the conversion on mental health. Mm -hmm. And I would like to invite you to take us uh, through these two uh, pieces of art uh, that uh, uh, we have with us here today. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, what we like, you know, drove you to choose this particular tool? What do they represent for you and for the women that you have worked with? Thank, Thank you. So this first portrait um, is uh, one of the women that impressed me the most mm -hmm. when we did the several session because there was like uh, maybe four phases in uh, the project. And this was the studio session, so the second phase. Um, and yeah, this young, because she's very young uh, lady, uh, was very, very, uh, the first time I met her, when I took a picture of her, she was very, uh, her face was very close and very, uh, the, the look was very dark. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we did this session, she really opened herself. So you can't see it really properly in this picture because her face is looking down. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is another picture because each woman during the photo session uh, were wearing uh, two different uh, clothes, dresses, mm -hmm. and the second, um, the second uh, dress she wore was uh, with flower, a very colorful uh, yellow and green flowers, mm -hmm. and she looks at the camera and she opens her arms and she's smiling, and that was really a gift she gave me. Mm -hmm. um, because she really opened herself and uh, she was very feminine and uh, she has a, a beautiful look, beautiful eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I really like these uh, pictures of her. Uh, and here you can see that she's looking like inside her with the makeup and uh, the necklace. Um, when you see her in reality, she's really Mm. So uh, it was really interesting um, to see our, revol uh, our evolution uh, during this uh, photo session. Mm. And then um, the second one is uh, the fourth phase I did with uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a series that was um, focusing on, uh, I asked uh, the, the ladies to, to choose an object she really cared about. And uh, so it was a, a way to, to make a portrait of this woman through the prism of an object. And we asked also uh, to tell some words about what represent this object for them. 
Uh, this one uh, is one of my favorite uh, pictures of this object. Um, the idea was also to show that this woman, they, they cared about the, the object they choose. Uh, this object could be anybody else's uh, object. Here is the chapel uh, to make prayers. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful one uh, with the colorful bracelets also. Mm. And uh, this, uh, this young lady, she said that she wanted to show this chaplet because uh, she's, she always has it on, a, on herself and she wants to be close to God and uh, uh, feel it prayer. So you cannot imagine that a woman using drugs uh, could maybe a favorite object could be a chapelet and that she prays every day, God. <laughs> but this is the truth. <laughs> She's a lady, a normal lady. She believes in God. And uh, in a way, she's close to God, like anyone that is close to God. So the idea was this, is uh, show that yeah, these women were like mothers and uh, had some some had kids. Um, some uh, were very young ladies, um, and they had uh, chosen for some uh, a pair of um, earrings because she it reminds her that she's a woman and she can be feminine so it was important and i think this is a photographic project that give her the idea of bringing these earrings some other uh, brought a book uh, and same you could not imagine that this woman would bring a, a book but yeah <laughs> They're still uh, reading and interested in things in life, not only in drugs. So that was the idea, and this is uh, what is uh, this picture is about. Thank you so much. Um, I really invite the audience to go and see uh, the exhibition in general and uh, see uh, the story of those, uh, those women and the realities uh, behind their, their lives. Uh, thank you very much for showing that. I will leave you now, our MC of the night. Uh, is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, through this project, you are able to restore this women's femininity, sense of beauty, sense of self-awareness, self-love, and self-discovery. And I would like to recommend uh, that and recommend that uh, everyone who is watching us should also check out our social media to really like do the art uh, uh, gallery. But as a wrap up, if you could uh, uh, tell us maybe within one word, what is a project you presented to you? What would that word be? In one, one word. In one word. Beauty is everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much. And this is what I, as a photographer, I always try to look at the beautiful side uh, of things. Mm. So I always try to yeah, put this in, uh, in front of my camera. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, this work and also like uh, being part of uh, this festival. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, Christelle Alas uh, uh, presenting us Amazon project. Uh, that show up to uh, own now with uh, the uh, women from Ivory Coast. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Yes, uh, thank you again, uh, Christelle. I'm now going to be introducing the last session of, uh, of the, today, which is day two of uh, Hamoy Festival. It is around resonant spaces, finding well-being through parks and uh, 
music. It's going to be moderated by Dr. Rebecca Jacobs. She's a Wellcome Trust Mental Health Curatorial Research Fellow at the Graduate Center, CAUNY's Center for the Humanities. She's working on the New York City component of Wellcome Mindscapes, an international cultural program about mental health. She was a 2017 through 2019 Mellon Postdoctoral uh, post Curatorial Fellow at the Museum of the uh, City of New York. Previously, Dr. Jacobs worked at the University of, of Massachusetts, Amherst, and uh, on a national-wide ethnographic study of retirement and insecurity, inter retirement insecurities and inequalities, which is quite an interesting um, uh, study. And that uh, Dr. Jacobs received her PhD in American Studies from Yale University with a concentration in public humanities. Dr. Jacobs, over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and hello from New York where it's the afternoon. And myself and the panelists here, um, I'll ask you to turn on your videos, panelists, um, now. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in in your evenings. It's fantastic to have this incredible global uh, coming together. So um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of context uh, about this panel about Parks and Music, which was organized in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust as part of Mindscapes, which is a new international cultural program about mental health. Many of you are familiar who've been part of the festival for, for these days now, but for anyone just tuning in, I'd like to share a little bit about Mindscapes. Um, Mindscapes is going to involve major collaborations in New York, Berlin, Tokyo, and Bengaluru over the next two to three years, with satellite partnerships in other locations. And the hope is that by telling stories and building shared narratives, we can really change how we understand, address, and think about mental health. And we are thrilled that Welcome is collaborating with the University of Global Health Equity, given the university's focus on equity, justice, and community-based approaches to health, and that this project is part of Mindscapes. Um, this is a truly international project, and I'm excited to continue to develop translocal connections such as this one. So I'm going to just briefly introduce our three distinguished guests, Ellen Reed, Adadayo Perkovich, and Mitchell Silver. I'm going to keep your bio short. They are incredible. Please look them up because I just, in the interest of time, I'm going to go right through these. Ellen Reed is a composer and sound artist whose breadth of work spans opera, sound design, film scoring, ensemble, and choral writing. She was awarded the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in Music for her opera, Prism. Ellen has co-founded the Luna Composition Lab, a mentorship program for young female identifying non-binary and gender non-conforming composers. She is the composer and sound designer of Soundwalk, Soundwalk, a free work of public sound art for Central Park and in other locations, which we'll be discussing. Adedayo Perkovich is a senior at the Dalton School in New York City. She is a senior member of the Young People's Chorus of New York City and oboe student and soprano section leader in the Juilliard Music Advancement Program. Adedayo is one of the collaborators on the Soundwalk project as well. Mitchell Silver is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks. Commissioner Silver is also an award-winning planner with over 35 years of experience and past president of the American Planning Association. As New York City's Parks Commissioner, he oversees management, planning, and operations of nearly 30,000 acres of parkland. He has also spearheaded new initiatives to make the park system more equitable and improve public health, which we'll hopefully get to get have a discussion of. So now we are going to watch a short film. This is actually the premiere of the short film about Soundwalk and putting it in the context of mental health and parks, featuring Ellen Reed and Mitchell Silver. I'll turn it over to the festival organizers to screen the film for everyone. Thank you. Music is powerful. And music is a way that we connect in a big way with each other. It's a way to communicate and it's a way to communicate in this raw, pure form. Soundwalk is a GPS driven work of public sound art. You download an app and it's a free app and you put on your headphones and then you just start walking. 
and the app follows your GPS to trigger sounds that should illuminate the landscape around you. I designed musical themes to kind of fit with the themes of the layout of the park. So there's a water theme that comes in themes and variations anytime you're around a water feature in the park. And then woven through that, I was doing research about current and historical events of things that have happened in different locations in the park and subtly weaving clues about those things into the soundscape. We're now in Central Park, which is the most iconic park in the world. And I have the privilege to oversee 30,000 acres of parkland here in New York City. When you come here, most people don't know that this was designed and developed, this did not exist. And so this is now a green oasis where people can come and escape. It's really the lungs of the city and people are really using it that way, both centuries ago, as well as today. People come here for a personal trainer. We have festivals, we have walking tours, birthday parties, picnics, bachelorette parties, everything happens here in the park. There's something about being in nature that just really makes you feel better. I tell people don't take a mental health day, just take a walk in a park. Mindscapes is an international cultural project that explores what mental health is, how we think about it, how we tell stories about it, how we interact with it. So many people in a large city have multiple experiences within a park. And this very spot has all of these layers of experience of urban life and this richness that comes with urban life. I wanted to create a project that lets you kind of sit with that richness and explore that richness through sound and through stories and through individual sonic experience. Central Park never gets old. This is a park for all people, regardless of your race, your income, there's something here for you to do. And you walk away with an incredible experience time after time after time. To add music is just another element. It's another one of your senses that make you escape from New York but it just transports you away and helps you reduce that stress. So music, walking, parks, they all go together. The way that we've had to put Soundwalk together has been this really unique experience that's created a large international team. We have the New York Philharmonic. We have an incredible New York-based jazz band called Pool and the Gang. We have the Young People's Chorus of New York City. We have a small team of me and an assistant sound designer, Dante Green, who have been coming to the park through thick and thin to test these sounds. My hope going forward is that we can continue to invest in parks. When you do that, you invest in your residents, you invest in health, and you invest in present and future generations. I believe that music helps us connect with parts of ourselves and process and hold space for some challenging emotions and challenging experiences. And this project is so special because you're fully surrounded by music and as a listener, you can control exactly what sound world you wanna be in. So in a way we've created this uh, structure where the listener gets to be the composer. Thanks everyone for watching. And I'm really excited about this opportunity to really talk across um, sectors, which is exactly what Hamway is all about. So bringing the arts and music in conversation with planning and public health. And I'm just so thrilled to have you all here. So Ellen, I'll ask you, um, this first question is for Ellen Reed. Um, how does Soundwalk fit into Mindscapes? You know, Mindscapes is so wonderful in the way that it thinks about mental health in this really large and holistic way that addresses um, different sectors, as you're saying. So you have the research and you have the art. And within Soundwalk, we were kind of engaging with music and art, uh, thinking about these different sectors as well. So we wanted for it to be an artistic experience that was both uh, rooted in research, but also able just to be experienced as a listener and create space for mental health at a time that's really hard to find space. And can you um, tell me a little about where the idea came from for Soundwalk and, and why it was important for you to situate Soundwalk specifically in a park? 
Yeah. So I love taking jogs. I take a jog almost every day, no matter where I am. And it's a way for me to kind of get situated in the world. You know, as a musician, I'm really in my head and I'm not always in the world. And so when I'm done working, I take a jog. And it was probably about three years ago, I was jogging in Prospect Park. And I was really struck by this thought that like my running path meant everything to me. And I knew it so well, but that there were so many other people who had intimate experiences with those same locations in the park. Um, it was really overwhelming to think about how one location in a park, one park bench could have so many different meanings for so many people. And it held all of these memories and this, this richness and this complexity of urban life. And I wanted to create a project that used sound to um, make space for that complexity and richness. Thank you so much. And now I'm um, turning over to speaking with Commissioner Silver. Um, can you tell us a bit about New York's park system, especially for a global audience, what makes uh, New York City's park system stand out? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, New York City is one of the oldest park cities, uh, uh, park systems in the world, uh, starting with Central Park. And we have over 2,000 parks, 30,000 acres, or 12,000 hectares that those that don't understand uh, the conversion from acres to hectares. New York is a dense city. And so to make this city livable, open space and density go together. New York City could not be livable without our parks. We have large parks, we have small parks, we have playgrounds. And in New York City, over 80% of our population is within a 10 minute walk to a park. So New York City's park system is old, it's, it's gorgeous. And because it has such age to it, you have these beautiful trees, well over a hundred years old. And so it's a unique park system, Central Park, of course, being the most iconic park. And what's nice about our park system is back then we didn't have parks, people actually went to cemeteries because it was so dense, they were craving open space. So Central Park being the first major park designed, Frederick Law Olmsted, his son actually died of cholera, which I think gave him that motivation and passion to build these green spaces. And then after that came Prospect Park and many other parks. So in New York City, we have a very diverse system, waterfront parks, the High Line, small playgrounds. So it's really a park a system for all ages, all experiences throughout the entire city. Thank you so much. And I think you, you've sort of touched on this already, but how do you think, uh, why do you think Central Park in particular holds such a place in the lives of New Yorkers? And especially during this pandemic, can you get a little into the ways that the parks are serving people, especially Central Park, but others? Well, most people don't know that before Central Park was created, it, it was just land with some structures on it. And Central Park is really a work of art. It was really the beginning of landscape architecture where the entire land, the park was mold and shaped for people to experience what it is to be in nature. Uh, it was kind of designed to think that you were upstate New York. And the designer separated people, and at that time it was more horse carriages and cars, so that people can go in there and just escape New York. Being the first one, the center of the heart and the lungs of New York City makes it that destination where everybody wants to go to. And it was Central Park that really created this whole movement around the United States about what a park should be. It has everything for everyone from passive meadows, you can run, you can walk, you can bike, you can take a horse carriage. And so it's just this amazing park in the heart and the center of Manhattan that is so iconic and so beautiful that it really sets parks apart. And it is, in my opinion, the most iconic park on the planet. Thank you so much. I think what you brought up is so interesting because of course this is designed nature that you're pointing to and the artistic and design elements of the park are so important and so for Ellen and the team to have worked on this sound art project in some ways is a reminder of the relationship between nature and design already. And so this is this additional incredible layer. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing a little more from Ellen and then Adadayo about this, the research and design process. So Ellen, can you just give a quick overview of the whole team and who is involved with the research and process? Yeah, so we worked with Welcome, and you were the uh, curatorial 
one of the curatorial forces, which was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, we partnered with the New York Philharmonic. Uh, we also partnered with the Young People's Chorus of New York City, and we had a New York-based jazz group called Pool and the Gang. Um, outside of that, we had a German-based sound engineer who helped edit the sounds, and all of the instruments that you heard mixed well in that video were recorded individually in different people's homes across the US. I don't think anyone was outside the US, but it was a group of um, musicians within the New York Phil and also outside of the New York Phil who were recording themselves from home. And Ada Dio, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here and I'd love to hear about um, your involvement through the Young People's Chorus of New York City. Can you tell me a little about uh, first just how you got involved and why this project is important to you? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the event coordinators uh, at the Young People's Chorus reached out to me about uh, the opportunity to just be part of this project. And I was intrigued. Uh, I had worked with um, Ellen Reed on a past uh, composition with DC, and I really enjoyed doing that. I thought the piece was beautiful, and I already really loved her work. So even though I didn't know much about the project going in, I was really excited to uh, take her on this opportunity. And then um, coming into it, I started writing poetry was my contribution ultimately. So um, yeah, I wrote some poems about the uh, statues that are in the park and about um, Seneca Village, one of the historical sites that um, Ellen Reed mentioned in like her process of highlighting different aspects of the park. So uh, Seneca Village was one of my main focuses in my poetry. Um, and I would say that that ultimately was a big part of why this project became so important to me and so personal to me. Um, doing the research about Seneca Village, about um, a group of African-American and uh, German and Irish um, immigrants who had built a community uh, on the land um, that was that existed before, uh, like Commissioner Silver spoke about, before the park, um, building those communities, owning land there. Um, a group of African American people who were able to vote in the 18th century because they owned land when that was um, ex extremely rare for the other their counterparts in the rest of New York City who um, couldn't vote because of the property clause. Um, just learning about that community and then. Um, seeing how like even as I enjoyed the park as just a New York City teenager, I didn't know about this until like extremely recently. So then being able to write about that and highlight the experiences of people in the past who, you know, look like me uh, was really meaningful and to be able to put it to music as a musician was uh, really special. And then being able to go to the park and have that intimate experience of listening to my own work and then also like the path that I, the unique path that I took and hearing different musical themes was really special. Thank you so much. And I think one, one thing I'm interested in about this is uh, just the example of Seneca Village is a reminder that this project dealt with um, complex stories from the past and present. And it's not, uh, the way you take on mental health is very interesting. So both Ellen and Adedayo, either of you could answer sort of, how does that complex approach relate to mental health? How were you thinking about mental health when you when you were doing this project? I'll go first. So, you know, I think it felt really important to create space to have a discussion and to help um, feel seen and heard where we, uh, you know, the project was meant to create space for um, a listener to be able to go into a park and find some um, space to process whatever they were going through. And there had to be room for people to be going through a wide variety of experiences anytime. And especially right now, there are so many heightened emotional experiences we're going through. Um, and I didn't feel like we could do that truly without um, poetically gesturing towards some of the complexities that come with living in an urban space. And so, you know, um, talking about like the, the beauty and the richness of the park and the history of Seneca Village and what it means, um, I think definitely addresses mental health because it 
brings us all into one, one story and it lets those stories be heard. Thank you so much. And um, I'd love to hear just a little about how the sound design, as we were speaking earlier about designing parks, um, relates to those stories. So how did you think about the, the sounds in relationship to those, the research? So, you know, the sounds were, as, as Commissioner Silver was saying, that the park is a work of art already. It just is. And so I felt like when I was composing the music, I was doing a dance with the designer where I was trying to highlight the, the movement of the park so that if you were coming from under a bridge into an open space that the music illuminated that so that it would be maybe more dense. And then as you moved into the open space, it would be more spacious with different instruments that feel uh, open and hopeful like that, the way that the emotion of moving through that park was. Um, you know, there are different ways that the research came into the music. Um, there's the beautiful poetry that uh, Adedayo and a few of her uh, collaborators at Young People's Chorus created for specific locations. Um, there were, uh, there is a Beethoven and a Duke Ellington statue and those in those two locations, we feature those composers' music. Um, also in the Ramble, which is an area that made the news uh, this summer with um, a situation with a bird watcher who um, had a very racist thing happen to him. Um, uh, I read through one of his interviews and took the names of all the birds that he listed and transcribed their bird calls and wove that into the musical soundscape of the ramble. And um, that particular person, he, his response to this attack was so generous that I named that movement after uh, a line from, from that interview. So there are different ways that this, the research comes into the music. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Silver, I'm gonna turn it back to you to talk a little about um, the mental health and well-being side of this conversation. And of course, um, I, we'd love to hear some about the, the efforts of the Parks Department and your team uh, to learn more about mental health and public health and New York City residents and equity. Thank you. Well, I first wanna remind people that the explosion of green space really happened during the last pandemic of the 1918, when people realized they needed open space, public space, not just for physical health, but for mental health. Today, if you watch people entering Central Park, you just see the anxiety and stress just drip off of them as they walk into the park. There's something about nature and all the senses, which is why I love the sound walk so much. It's the smell, it's the touch, it's the sight. It's really being in a green space Nature really is very therapeutic. And so it's so important, especially during COVID. We're seeing record numbers of people going into the parks because they realize the mental health benefits. You just escape their everyday life. And that's what parks were designed for. What we're doing right now is trying to create an equitable park system. We have over 2000 parks, but not every park in New York City was invested in the same way. I'm sure Adedaya will tell you as she goes to different parks, not all of them look like Central Park. So our goal was to create an equitable park system and focus on neighborhoods that hadn't seen investment in their parks in over 20 years and to improve those as well. We're doing that across the city. We're looking at the edges of our parks and we're taking down barriers, whether it's a fence or a wall to make it more visually accessible, but have it blend into the neighborhood. And so that's our focus. And we're already seeing the mental health benefits because during COVID, not everybody can get to Central Park. We want to make sure they have an open green space nearby that they can enjoy, get healthy, both physically as well as mentally. Thank you so much. And do you want to share any stories since part of the point of Soundwalk, which I think is so lovely and moving, is that it's really often through these anecdotes and stories that we can process these larger kind of studies or larger kinds of shifts culturally. And well, there, there are two. I'm going to give you two ends of the spectrum from a young child and then from one of our older residents. For the older resident, I remember we were redoing this playground. It was across the street from a nursing home that didn't have a public space. So I told my staff to redesign this playground, but have a seating area for seniors 
The day we opened it up, this woman in a wheelchair came up to me, grabbed my hand. I said, thank you so much. Because of you, I'm going to live longer because now I can sit here with my daughter and watch my grandchildren play basketball. She said, thank you. My life has changed because of this space being changed. Another one, which always kind of chokes me up, is that we were opening up a playground in Brooklyn. It was an asphalt playground, like many New York City playgrounds, just asphalt. And we changed it and converted it, running track, artificial turf, play equipment, a lot of trees, and a little boy, Hispanic, about eight years old, would not go into the park. And we asked them, why won't you come in? And he said he didn't know how much it cost to go into this park because it looked that nice. And it broke my heart because his entire life, he was used to seeing an asphalt playground with high fences. His life will change. Every child in that neighborhood's life will change and that's what this initiative is doing, is bringing quality parks, because it's not just about health and physical health, it's about creating memories and friendships. And so that's why this initiative is so important. I have more stories, but that just gives you a flavor of the different spectrum from young and old. Thank you so much. I think these stories are just an incredible addition to the broader discussion, because it really clarifies what we mean and why mental health is so closely related to parks. And, um, and equity. So uh, another question for Commissioner Silver, can you tell me about your ambition for the future of New York City's parks? We have a lot of challenges, but what do you hope for? One, it's really about equity, which I talked about, access. And access really to me, it's not just about the physical access, it's the mental access and being inclusive. We used to have signs in our parks that said, you can't loiter. Now, if you think for a second, loitering means to sit around idly by with no apparent purpose. That's what you do in a park. And so in 2017, through a law, we changed all the signs and now you can't loiter in a park. That's what we want you to do, to sit around just doing nothing. That to me was a barrier and it was targeted mostly at teenagers. So we had an art project called Yes Loitering to show how we do want people to enjoy a public space, particularly teenagers. We wanna make sure that our parks are welcoming to all. And to think about if you wanna invite someone to your home, how do you want them to feel welcome? So inclusive parks means welcoming to all, for all, and that is our other goal. But to make them accessible, to be authentic to the culture, the community, all of the differences of our city, that people will feel welcome, enjoy them, and remove those barriers such as walls and fences and rules that make people not feel welcome in public space. Finally, we're renaming public spaces. Just recently renamed uh, about 10 spaces for Black New Yorkers that were significant to show that our stories can also be told in the New York City park system. So those are just some things and I expect more and more of that to happen in the future. Equitable, access and inclusive, accessible and inclusive. Thank you. This next question is for Adedayo. It's about um, the sort of personal and collective nature of the project and parks for you more broadly because we've been talking again again about big big sort of uh, societal shifts and challenges. And yet we're also talking about individual stories. And I just like to ask, how is Soundwalk personal and collective for you? How are New York's parks personal and collective for you? Um, well, for me, even when I was younger with my mom, um, we're big walkers. That's probably why we love New York City so much. Um, but it was kind of too time making little like five-year-old on walk in Central Park and on the High Line. Um, and so that's uh, the parks in New York City are already a big part of my childhood. And then when I started the Young People's Chorus when I was eight, um, the, the facility that we have now is like across the street from the west side of Central Park. So always before, after rehearsals. Um, me and a few of my friends would take time like between school and rehearsal to to in the park, loiter, uh, relax, and like talk about our school days, share our experiences. Um, and sometimes we would like delve into different personal we had with like, different places we were in in the park, like concerts we'd seen or um, funny things, only things that would happen in the park. Um, and then after rehearsal, just walking down before home um de-stressing before like having to do homework the park was always a place for me to do that and to participate in uh, sound walk 
I think we may have lost Adadayo uh, to a, a connection. So hopefully she'll rejoin us and we'll be able to continue to hear her wonderful thoughts um, on both her experiences of the park and Soundwalk. Um, so while we're hoping to get her back, um, I will ask, I wanna ask Ellen and Mitchell Silver, Ellen Reed, Mitchell Silver, do you have any questions for one another? Oh, I, I'm hoping, oh, we have Adadaya back. So let's let her finish. Adadaya, maybe if you leave your video off and just use audio, we can hear you. Are you there? Um, why don't we wait for Adadaya to connect one more time? Adadaya, are you there? Okay, I'm gonna ask while we will return to Adadayo, um, Ellen, Reed, Mitchell, Silver, do you have any questions for each other that have come up from this panel? Yes, uh, when you were running, uh, I'm just, I was gonna ask you the questions, how did this idea come about? And so you did give that answer, uh, but now that you've actually created this, what has the response been? Because when I first heard the concept and I watched the video, uh, I didn't download it yet. I'm going to do that when I go for my walk. Uh, what has the reaction been? Because I'm so moved. You think of having an outdoor speaker, but to do it in harmony with nature, you know, is very intriguing. So what kind of reaction have you gotten so far? You know, I have to say the reaction we've gotten from Soundwalk has been really different than any other art piece I've ever done. Usually I get nice emails from friends and family, like, we're so proud of you, you know, <laughs> with this this has been really different where people say, you know, thank you for doing this. Thank you for um, putting this together. And they say that they understand the park differently. They, they're spending much more time in the park than they would spend. Um, you know, I've gotten a few like long form thank yous, which is really meaningful. And I mean, we've had around 20,000 uses of wow. this. Um, which is really incredible. I mean, and so the response has been really different because I think people need it now. You know, I know that I needed it when I was putting it together and it really helped me get through the first six months of um, the pandemic. So I'm glad that that uh, has translated to listeners as well. Yeah. Looks like we have Adadayo back. If for some reason, um, you maybe it's best to switch to audio only for the connection for you. Um, and I'd love to hear you continue to tell us um, what you were discussing in terms of the personal and collective. Um, I guess the connection dropped out of the same thing. Um, but yeah, so going back to just the park being really a special place for me uh, as a childhood, and like as a musician, taking time there. And then uh, walking my first time experiencing the actual Soundwalk app and using the Soundwalk app um, was, I didn't even have, I couldn't imagine how I would shape in the park and hear described in working on the party. Like just experiencing it was completely different from what I imagine walking to the park 110 and like hearing kind of beautiful music and hearing the water theme and then walking all the way down to Seneca Village and the kind of somber tone that it took there. It just, it really struck me how each person that has their heart will be composing a completely different journey themselves. And so I think that that personal we're having a little trouble hearing you if maybe you could stop video and just switch to audio only we'll have a better chance to hear you because you're saying such incredible things and i see you might be on mute but that might also just be a connection if you could just repeat the last 10 seconds of what you were saying that would be great thank you video um but yes, I think the personal um, aspect of sound walk is what makes it so meaningful for the like, collective side of things. Talking about the acknowledge um, the historical and the aspects of the park. 
Um, and I bet if you take your own personal journey to talk at me and whatever you use and encountering these messages and these um, musical motifs, it really makes me think about how you as a person have engaged with the park in the past and how this might change how you engage with the park and how you about something that's hearing about that has been with the park. I'm so sorry, breaking up still. Are you having, are the other panelists having trouble hearing? I'm so sorry, Adedayo, we're having trouble hearing. Maybe there's a way for you to put something in the chat or send me an email that I can read to everyone because we just really appreciate what you're saying, but we're having trouble hearing you. So feel free to um, pop something in the chat that I'll read to the whole group. Um, in the meantime, um, Ellen Reed, do you have any questions for Mitchell Silver? I do. I want to know what you think are some of the most underrated parks. What are some like hidden gem parks that as a, someone who lives in New York, I should know about? Wow. Well, first, the story of park It's not, I wouldn't say it's a not a known park, but it is one that is so beautiful in terms of its views under the bridges. Uh, it is just spectacular. Uh, another part of Reynolds Island most people don't know about is the southern part of the island. When people go there, it's known for the electric circus and all these big concerts. When you go to the southern end and you turn a corner, it's actually across from Astoria Park. It's one of those hidden gems. Hunters Point South, Long Island City. Uh, there's two parts to it. It's looking across from uh, Manhattan. Uh, but the newest phase too is this amazing experience that you can just walk through. It's kind of like the high line, but twisted in a landform. And it actually creates an island uh, when it's high tide. So those are just three, but we have so many. We have 2000. I have some of my favorites. Uh, Heather's Garden, uh, that's in Inwood Park for Tryon. Uh, it's just incredible overlooking the Washington uh, Bridge. So there's just so many ones that uh, are just amazing. And then our Green Thumb Gardens that are just 600 of them all over New York City that have been providing this very localized, hyper-local experience for those that can't get to one of their local parks. I wanna share an anecdote. So uh, I wanna check all of those out. Okay, but so to get to Central Park from my house, it's 11 miles and I had to bike there because I didn't wanna take the train. I can almost bike the entire way through parks. Isn't that amazing? That's it is. Know. And uh, I'm a runner like you, and I run in Prospect Park, so I'll look out for you next time. But you can. You can go across the West Side Highway. It's probably my preference as a runner and a biker once you get there, and then you can cut over to Central Park. But you're right. We're working on East River. It's a work in progress. But the West Side, best experience, this unbelievable greenway going from the Battery all the way up uh, so, to the tip of Manhattan. Little Red Lighthouse. Thank you so much. So now we're opening it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, I also am hoping we can hear from Adedayo in the chat box or else uh, some other way or possibly back to audio. Um, but in the meantime, um, some questions that have come in. I think um, this might be a question for Mitchell Silver. Um, how do you respond to those who may see parks as a waste of space due to its perceived lack of financial value? So the, 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 the calculated evaluation of land. Well, you don't just look at the cost, you look at the value. Uh, what do you tell a child that uh, has a disability and now can play and laugh for the first time? You can't put a price tag on that. You cannot have a quality city without open space. It's what helps us keep, up, keep us alive. It's where you have festivals, where people come together. So there's a value in parks and people who give away parks that don't see the value, I feel it's like giving away a child's inheritance. You cannot gain that back. You may eat and sleep in your home and apartment, but people live in public space. That's why it's so important. And so it's not a waste at all. I've been to places that don't have parks and open space and you just feel the anxiety. And during COVID, during COVID, parks have been the sanctuaries of sanity. That's where life took place. When people couldn't go anywhere else, everyone came to a park. And I don't want to see more pandemics in the future, but it became the unsung hero and shiro of cities across the country, and I assume across the world. So parks are vital infrastructure for mental health, for climate change, for just social gatherings. And a city that does not have a great park system, I'm concerned, I just don't think it's going to be a great city. So it actually has a lot of value. It may not be financial value, but value is not just in money, value is in living as well. 
Thank you so much. I think maybe Adedayo, you're back with, um, it, you've written me that maybe you're available through your phone. So we're gonna see if you can just repeat the last part of what you said. And if I can't hear you, we'll have to just catch up another time. But um, Adedayo, can you try to finish up what you were saying? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, beautifully. So we want you to have the space to repeat some of the things you were saying um, because we did miss quite a bit. And it, I could tell from the snippets, it was incredible. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I think the personal aspect of Soundwalk is what makes it so impactful for um, societal change, given that each person walking through the park um, will be hearing a unique uh, kind of version of the musical themes and motifs and of the poetic acknowledgement of uh, the historical and cultural events that are happening in the park. And so I think as each person takes their unique journey, they'll also have to confront how they as an individual um, with their unique identity and with their unique experience in the park in the past and in Soundwalk, uh, how they relate to these events, how they relate to the nature and the art in the park and now the music that they're hearing and how that kind of contributes to um, their larger experience in New York and talking about the access and equity and inclusion uh, that Commissioner Silver was mentioning. So hearing about like, the incident with the bird watcher and hearing about Seneca Village. Um, if you hadn't heard about that before, like confronting why you hadn't. And then um, as Ellen Reed was saying, like people reaching out to each other after they have the opportunity to experience this because it is a public space, which is so important. And it's a public art project, which makes it um, accessible to so many people. So then having the opportunity to discuss it with other people who took a walk in the park and by nature of the project will have a different experience um, just opens things up to so many like fruitful conversations that I think can really emphasize those ideas that um, already with the design of the park, um, with what Commissioner Silver is doing, and with the emphasis on mental health that Ellen Reed is communicating with the project um, that will provide for larger changes in the city and hopefully in like the outlook on parks and the outlook on these societal events as well. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for just one or two more questions. So this one is, I think, directed at Ellen from the audience. Um, can sound walks and sound experiments work outside of a park setting or what examples might you have? How, how might sound walks um, work in other places? Yeah, so, I mean, ours was specifically around uh, Central Park and around that location and around, uh, designed with the idea of, of nature as the collaborator, but I could definitely see um, the technology is capable of mapping onto any space. So you could easily design a, you know, an open public space or even a, a street with, um, you could kind of illuminate it with sound through the technology. The technology isn't linked to a map uh, or sorry, to a, a natural landscape. So I, for example, the thing that's coming to mind is there was a, a food critic named Jonathan Gold who uh, did this amazing thing in Los Angeles. He went down Pico uh, Boulevard and ate at every single restaurant. And Pico Boulevard is one of those streets that stretches through all these different kinds of communities. And I could see somebody doing something like that. So taking a street that um, expresses kind of like the heart of a city and the way that it touches on um, different points of view and different communities and, uh, and then kind of bringing those uh, points of view into a soundscape. I could see something like that being really exciting as a celebration of um, the richness within a city. And can you just tell us briefly, Soundwalk is actually going to travel, so within the U.S. and possibly internationally, and this is an international festival, so I thought I would just ask briefly if you could tell us about that. Yeah, so Soundwalk um, has already been in a few locations in the U.S., and we're looking at doing one on the west coast of the U.S. and potentially in Europe. Um, and so each of the different spaces um, the programming will illuminate that specific environment using the same musical themes. So that as you move through uh, whatever park it will be installed in, it will, uh, the music will work to illuminate the landscape. 
And depending on where the park is and uh, the history of it, we will also work with local um, collaborators like Aradayo to write meaningful poetry about those locations. So it's really exciting for me to learn about these different locations in the US and abroad and kind of think about how to um, weave them into a large project that hopefully gives people some mental space to process this moment. Well, thank you so much, Ellen Reed, Adedayo Perkovich and Mitchell Silver. I am so grateful to have had the three of you on for this discussion and look forward to continuing Mindscapes both in New York and internationally in the coming years. Everyone, please take good care and be well. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob and the panelists. So I have to confess that I love to walk uh, in uh, Central Park whenever I'm in New York, which is actually a park that I discovered through the novels that I have read about US. So uh, these uh, panelists have challenged us to think uh, creatively and differently about uh, parks and spaces. Um, I have to say that whenever I'm here in Rwanda, I love to spend time in beautiful and natural landscape that we do have, but also this uh, panel discussion invited our countries, all countries actually to keep including parks and open spaces in urban designing. And as it was well put, um, parks are a sanctuary of every society. So without them, our mental health is compromised. Um, I also would like to touch base on the component of equity and access to many, which also resonates with the Hammer Festival theme around the element of mental health and social justice. During the pandemic, we have seen it well, uh, places where people could go to open spaces and to parks and have some mental sanity was a richness. And I would like to summarize these uh, um, panel discussion in actually the powerful uh, gratitude story that uh, uh, Commissioner Michelle has uh, shared uh, with the woman who said, I quote, my life has changed because the space has changed. That's the space that you could have access to. Thank you so much all for making this day an inspiring one. We have learned together. We have exchanged ideas, inspired each other, and dreamed about the future and what is possible. And you know what? It is not over. So we're going to be continuing our conversation. This is just the end of uh, to, uh, day, today, which is to, uh, day two. And we hope also you had fun as we did here. And as I mentioned uh, at the beginning and throughout this uh, event, the festival is ours, but also it is yours. Keep sharing your reflections and ideas on our social media at the UGHE and the Hamway social media handles that were shared before. And we are looking forward to keep engaging with each other. So again, this festival is organized by University of Global Health Equity and is also supported with some of our partners, Welcome Trust, Ambassador de France au Rwanda, Institut Francais, and Hang Up. I would like to end on a thank you note. I would like to wish you a wonderful night. But before that, uh, I'm going to uh, be saying a heartfelt thank you to, first of all, our guest of honor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Atersis Munga, but also our panelists, the moderators, the entire Hamo Festival that has done an incredible job behind the scene to ensure that this day was a present experience for all of us. On this note, I'm going to say goodbye and see you tomorrow. But before that, we have a challenge for tomorrow. And before I share the challenge, let's share a little bit more about how tomorrow is going to look like. So we have exciting sessions. And we're going to be exploring issues like uh, music and mental health and how they benefit uh, uh, 
the mental health of all of us, as well as our well-being. We're going to be exploring uh, how therapeutic roles, what is the therapeutic role of uh, traditional music, and we are going to be uh, continuing the conversation that you have opened today. And the challenge that we have today is what Dr. Nadine uh, has left us with. So tonight, I challenge you to take some time to do something creative or to engage with your most favorite uh, part of art. It can be dancing, can be drawing, can be reading a book. It can be looking at our art gallery that is uh, online. And on that note, I wish you a good night and a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.